benvenuto qui Lucia Urbino per la sua open lecture che si intitola Artificial Intelligence, Aesthetics and Future of Culture. Eh, Lev Manovic non ha bisogno di molte presentazioni, voi tutti lo conoscete per aver studiato i suoi lavori, per aver visto i suoi progetti, come sapete si tratta di uno dei principali teorici della cultura digitale a livello mondiale, si occupa di media studies, di software studies, di cultural analytics in particolare, ovvero delle potenzialità, se dovessimo definirlo in breve, della scienza dei dati applicate all'analisi della cultura contemporanea. Lo fa sia da teorico che da progettista, perché Manovic insegna da tanti anni presso il Graduate Center della City University of New York, ma è anche direttore del Cultural um, Analytics Lab, che ha aperto la strada all'analisi della cultura visiva proprio attraverso metodi computazionali, quindi è impegnato in prima linea su questi due fronti che per lui sono paralleli e si intrecciano. Il Cultural Analytics Lab ha poi infatti ideato e sviluppato vari progetti, sia per il Museum of Modern Art di New York, che per la New York Public Library, per Google e per moltissimi altri. Oggi dicevamo esce il suo nuovo libro che è Cultural Analytics, esce per Meet Press proprio oggi, quindi Manovic è riuscito a ritagliarsi del tempo per, per noi, siamo veramente contenti. E, ed è da poco uscito in italiano, lo ricordo perché collegato ai temi di oggi, il suo libro L'estetica dell'intelligenza artificiale. Tra i suoi lavori ricordiamo però anche i lavori dedicati a Instagram, Instagram in contemporanea image e software text command per esempio, oltre al celebrato e notissimo linguaggio dei nuovi media. Eh, il suo lavoro ruota dunque intorno a questi temi da diversi anni, principalmente potremmo parlare di estetica dei media, come dell'orizzonte in cui tutti i suoi interessi si rafforzano e si intrecciano, ed è in questa chiave che possiamo riflettere qui oggi proprio sul rapporto tra intelligenza artificiale e produzione culturale, da qui eh, al futuro. Uh, finisco qui la mia breve introduzione. Uh, so, thank you for being here. Of course, thank you, Lev, for being here with us in this um, special day for you. Uh, we are very glad to welcome you to Isia Urbino with all our students, even if virtually, of course, uh, but maybe in the future also, you know, in, not in virtual reality, but in, in, in reality as well. Uh, I've not finished with my short introduction, so it's up to you, you can start when you want. I finished, okay. So, buongiorno a tutti, uh, buongiorno mm -hmm. students, buongiorno Valentina. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. making this happen. Uh, I was supposed to come last year, but uh, because of my fault and maybe too many train connections in Italy, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't make it. Um, It is a very special day for me. In a few minutes, you'll find out why. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to say that Valentina is not only a colleague, but I think of her as a very good friend. Mm -hmm. She is also kind of my, one of my, you know, idols, you know, one of my influencers, because mm -hmm. she's a wonderful scholar, uh, also, you know, but herself a very visual person and mm -hmm. warm, uh, supportive, rigorous, everything mm -hmm. you want a person to be. <laughs> So I think you're all very lucky to have her. And uh, I would love to know a bit more Italian and actually to be in the class and uh, mm -hmm. maybe learn a bit of design. Uh, because when I took a graphic design class, when I was undergraduate student, I actually got like a C, which is, you know, in America, it's like not a very good grade. Uh, yeah. So maybe, maybe one day I can take a class and make it like a B. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, And, um, you know, I will kind of go over my presentation. Uh, if there are some kind of deep, big questions, please uh, wait until the end. But you can also at any time write a question in the chat. So when we start with, you know, questions and answers, you know, I can look at the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, if, but during my presentation, if I you know, have some name or some term, something very simple, which is unclear, you know, please feel to also interrupt uh, because I kind of want you to understand. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I have uh, you know, slides and keynotes and I'm also happy to, I can put this presentation on Dropbox and I can share the links you know, if you want to have it. So let me start. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I think 
Maybe like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can't share the screen. Okay. Well, yeah. it's already starting. Already mm -hmm. starting. Uh, Maybe we need why? to wait just for a few seconds. Well, I don't know. There's no 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 seconds. It's um, sometimes and, uh, sometimes there is a little delay in um, sharing. Delay. Mm. Well, I can't even really. So, so I just have to wait. wait. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just yeah. wait for one two seconds. If not, well, for, just retry. For example, okay. by but, sharing but, your, an but, application but, and not your screen. The entire screen or something else. Uh, maybe, maybe not entire screen, but the keynote, for example, if you, you no, you're, you're using okay, keynote. okay. Yeah, well, let's or, try, let's try. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, I never I actually, you know, I I, mm -hmm. I, I like I, I got I like never use Google Meet, so that's why I'm mm -hmm. not prepared. So let's see if we can mm -hmm. use. Uh, no well, let's see if we can do it. No, nothing. Nothing. Okay, well, mm -hmm. if somebody can tell me how to fix it, because I don't know how to fix it. Uh, uh, okay, uh, maybe, ah, uh, maybe like you... this. Okay, we'll do, yeah. okay, yes, okay, okay, yes. Ah, perfect. Quick, maybe, mm -hmm. well, we don't know yet if it's not perfect, but we'll see. Okay, so let's try one more time. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm. Sorry, allow no application problem. below. Okay, I okay. know it's like this. I think it's like I think it's like just a second mm -hmm. until yeah. it's quit. Oh, okay, okay, it's okay. Actually, I need. Okay, maybe mm -hmm. I need to quit. Maybe I need to quit and uh, call uh, back. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe try. Yeah, let me, yeah. Let me try that. Okay. Let me try to just a moment. Just a moment. Uh, settings, video. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Are you okay. using Chrome, Lev? Maybe I'm Chrome. Using Chrome. Or... Okay, perfect. I'm using Chrome. Just, just, I'm using Chrome. Just it should, it should work. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. With the now, yeah. Now I think now it works. Yeah. I just have hmm. to restart. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we'll see okay. in a second. Yeah. No, uh, no okay. 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 So you see, yeah. you see. So what do you see? You see the screen? Uh, okay. We see something. Just what? your, just your logo, but it's. Uh, okay. So it doesn't work. It's the beginning. The logo. Yeah, it's work. Yeah. Okay. Do you see? Do you see a keynote? Yeah. Um, no, we see. Yes no? We see yeah. you split it in two. So your video well, and your presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know how to make it work, guys. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to make it work. Okay. Oh. So, okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, we can no. try. Let's, let's try. You know, just a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's try. Yeah. Know. Retry. It was, it was right. It was right. What about now? What about now? Now. No. No. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Now Do you we, see you oh. know? We see, we see, we see your keynote. You see. Okay, yeah. and if I say, if I say, if I say play, do you yeah, see yeah. it? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, if <laughs> something happens, please, uh, if something happens, you know, please let me know. Okay, so artificial intelligence, aesthetics, mm -hmm. and the future of culture. Um, so this presentation is based on uh, some of the ideas I developed you know, while running my lab, uh, which was established in 2007. And in 2008, and we started to learn data science and artificial intelligence techniques and making practical projects with cultural data. 
And then after about 10 years, I started kind of publishing books uh, about what I learned, my experience. Uh, so there has been three books, Instagram and Contemporary Image, which I kind of published myself. Then uh, AI Aesthetics, which is now, right, translated, I think, right, is translated into Italian. Valentina, correct? Valentina? Valentina? Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I was saying that, yes, your AI aesthetics is now in Italian as uh, yeah. l'estetica okay. dell'intelligenza artificiale, yes. Good, 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 yes. Okay, and then the cultural analytics, uh, which just came out actually today. So that's why I'm a bit nervous because I checked the Amazon, you know, just, uh, you know, half an hour ago and the book is on sale. Okay, so this is the covers, Instagram and contemporary image. Uh, AI aesthetics, that's the English cover. Sorry, I should have put Italian cover. And that's the new one, cultural analytics. So I want to tell you something about my biography uh, because it's relevant to my talk, but it also may be interesting for you since right, most of you are quite young and you're just kind of starting on your path. And maybe you're wondering you know, what you'll be doing you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, so I was born in Moscow. At the age of 17, I discovered uh, semiotics through the books of a very important, very influential Russian semiotician, Yuri Lotman, who I think is quite known in semiotic circles in Italy. Uh, in high school, I studied art. Uh, in addition to all the other subjects, right? I studied art, computer programming, and then I studied architecture in the Moscow Architecture School. And then we immigrated and I came to New York in 1981. And 1981 was a very interesting year uh, because this is when MTV started. And also IBM released the first PC. So this new kind of era, right, of computing and media in a way, got started, at least in the US. Um, so I continued my education at New York University Film School, uh, graduating in 1984, and I wanted to make experimental films. But uh, now, right, you can make a film on your phone and edit it also on your phone or your computer, but of course, in the 80s, it was impossible. So if you ever go to a film museum, you'll see with film cameras and the lights and the whole machinery, required to make analog films, right, was so heavy, it was really like industrial production. Uh, so I got scared. I said, how can I possibly work with hundreds of people and direct them, and you have to get big budgets? And when I saw a very early computer animation, right, 3D computer animation, and I thought, that's wonderful. So maybe now I can make films on a computer. And um, at this point, there were only seven companies in the world which were using uh, 3D computer graphics for uh, special effects in films, like Tron and, uh, you know, and, and film titles and commercials, literally just a few companies. So I got a job in one of them, which was in New York. Um, and when I worked for two years, uh, even later I worked part-time, you know, and that's how I supported myself during my PhD studies. So I worked in a commercial sector, right, in companies for about six years. So that was a very important experience, which, uh, right, first of all, it taught me how to work quickly, right, how to work efficiently, which is not something everybody at university knows how to do. Oh, and also, it introduced me to how things happen, right, in the real world. Um, so after working for a couple of years full time, I said, that's all interesting, but it just takes too much of my energy going to work. So maybe I need to go back to university. And um, while I was still very interested in semiotics, um, I was also interested in psychology and the emerging field of cognitive science, right? how the brain works, how memory works, how vision works. And I wanted to see if you know, the knowledge in experimental psychology and neuroscience can be also used to understand visual communication. So I became a PhD student in cognitive science even after a couple of years, I realized that I don't want to do it because being a scientist is too hard and you have to spend you know, many, many months, sometimes years, 
doing experiments like in the dark room under controlled conditions and uh, the progress is very slow. And I thought maybe I want to go and make my home in humanities where I will not have as much funding as a scientist, but I'm really free to say whatever I want, right? I can just go to a cafe, open my laptop. Of course, laptops did, laptop did not exist in 93, right? But I mentioned, uh, right, open my computer and just start writing. And basically, I just have to simply convince people that my ideas are interesting. I don't need anybody, right? I don't need university. I don't need any heavy equipment. And I joined the new PhD program in visual culture. And in 93, I graduated with a PhD in visual culture. And then, right, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. So I was interested in uh, theories of images, um, but I had also a commercial background in visual effects. And also I had art background since, you know, for, since the age of 13. But it turned out that at this moment, this thing, new media or digital media was just emerging. In 1990, Apple introduced, uh, I think, uh, QuickTime and CD-ROMs. Even in 91, the web was invented. In 93, the web took off. Uh, and this kind of new media journey started, right? So it's almost 30 years ago. And it turned out that my strange combination of skills was very much in demand uh, because I had a PhD, right, in humanities. I also had masters in uh, social science. I knew how to program computers. I worked in the industry for six years and I also had art background and uh, it was perfect. And I immediately got a job as a professor of digital art, right? And then that's what I've been teaching, digital art and also media theory for 20 years. And uh, it's a bit paradoxical, right? Because I'm more known for my books, but actually for 20 years, I was a professor of digital art. So most of my classes were hands-on studio classes of digital art and design. Uh, and I spent right 90s being very much, I think, in the center of this emerging field of digital art, uh, which was very interesting because it was not very big and everybody knew each other, right? So it was an emerging field. But then uh, by early 2000s, suddenly became very big, uh, new uh, programming languages, such as processing, uh, were introduced in 2001. The computers became more affordable, right, faster. The graphics card became, you know, bit better. And then I realized around 2002, 2003, that maybe for me, digital art is no longer so interesting because I published my book, The Language of New Media, in 2001. And then I realized that now so many people are doing digital art, you know, there are so many programs emerging. Of course, there are many, many programs today, but it already started to happen you know, in the early 2000s. And I said, okay, I need to do something else. I want to do something else, which doesn't exist yet, uh, where maybe I can be first to one of the first people. And uh, in 2005, uh, I got this idea, but maybe uh, I can continue, right, my work with images, visual culture, visual media, to try to understand, right, how images create meanings and effects, uh, different techniques, conventions, right, uh, used by artists, designers, you know, filmmakers, architects throughout human and modern history, but as opposed to trying to understand a single image and how this image may signify or maybe emotional effects it can produce or messages it can communicate, I can actually study millions of images because uh, partly because of the switch of culture to kind of digital platforms. And that was even before social media, right? Social media only uh, became, started to become popular after 2007, but already in 2005, it became possible to add images to blogs. And uh, of course, you know, we already had millions of websites, you know, right? All the major museums had websites, all the design, architecture, art schools had websites. And I said, this is amazing. So what if I can use computers to somehow you know, find and download millions of these images and web pages, and then use the techniques of computer science, uh, computer vision, natural language processing, network science, and so on, uh, to try to find patterns and structures with large cultural data, and to be able to observe the development of modern culture, perhaps even in real time.
right? To be able to create a kind of real-time maps of contemporary culture worldwide by analyzing in real time millions of billions of images, you know, videos, web pages. Um, so I had this vision, I found funding. And then in 2007, we started kind of cultural analytics lab. And at this point, I didn't even know how to use Excel, right? I actually, even though I was programming all my life, right, I didn't really know data science. So first I learned Excel around 2009. Even in 2010, I started to teach myself R, which is a very popular programming language for data analysis. And in 2012, I actually got a new job in New York at the City University of New York Graduate Center in my PhD program in computer science. And that's also, of course, wonderful and kind of strange and paradoxical because I've never taken, like I think I only took one undergraduate class in, in programming as undergraduate in the 80s, so I never take taking any classes in computer science. So in 2013, I became professor in the PhD program in computer science. Uh, and that's my kind of has been my base for the last seven years. Um, so maybe it was a bit of a long introduction, <laughs> But I simply you know, wanted to tell you that especially today, you know, just when you finish your design schools, right? It doesn't mean that your learning is over. You can continue learning new things for the rest of your life. Not only that, but if you're curious enough, you can be uh, in the beginnings, you can basically be part of small groups of people who develop new fields, uh, new you know, design movements, new research movements, right? It doesn't matter if it's uh, political, ecological, you know, academic, uh, cultural, right? But you can be at the forefront, you can be avant-garde, and you can actually keep changing fields, right? So while I was interested in particular ideas, trying to understand you know, how visual communication works, trying to understand patterns in visual communication, uh, and that hasn't changed throughout my life, I kept changing, right, my kind of home basis, Right, so going from professor of art to professor of computer science, uh, kind of finding new platforms uh, to help me do my research. Hey, Valentina, you everything is okay? You guys hear me? Okay, perfect. Valentina, yeah, everything yeah, is yeah. good. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Okay. So, uh, one, yeah, one more, one more. Yeah, before we kind of get to today's topic, right? I want to. Uh, I don't necessarily want to tell you lots of like research results because you can also read my articles. I kind of want to throw lots of right, many different ideas, sometimes provocative. Um, so, so here I have a slide which uh, asks a question. So how should we educate students in creative fields in the age of AI, right? So we'll talk about AI and the use of AI and culture in a second, but what is the impact of education? Right, and uh, because some of us are wondering, you know, we see that AI is becoming gradually more successful, right? Uh, things which were thought impossible a few years ago become possible. So we may wonder, right, if you if you graduate students with degree in film, filmmaking, right, or visual communication, or in industrial design, or fashion design, you know, are we going to have employment in the field in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Well, it's hard to say, right? And um, we'll talk about it and maybe we'll have discussion after my lecture. But I would say as a kind of scientist, right, so to speak, it's kind of impossible, I think, to say right now, uh, will AI be able to create a right, variety of fashions, you know, web, websites, interior designs, uh, will basically have a kind of general cultural uh, artificial intelligence, so to speak, which will enable it, right, to create the amazing nuances, right, uh, the small differences, to manipulate materials, to understand the effect of materials, light, space, on human psyche, right? Uh, so we don't know if AI will be able to do what best architects, space designers, you know, fashion designers, photographers do, but it's possible, it's possible, right? We don't know yet. So how do you kind of play it safe, right? How do you prepare yourself for this future? And uh, what I want to say is that, right? So we don't know exactly what will happen, uh, but in my life, right? In my professional life, uh, Valentina can, I think, confirm the number of times I was able to somehow anticipate certain things 
before it became important. It doesn't happen every day, but it did happen to me you know, a few times, sometimes by a five, eight, 10 years. Like for example, I started to work with big cultural data. I mean, I, I thought about working with big cultural data in 2005, and now it's becoming more and more common. So it took almost 15 years, right? And uh, when I started right, to think about the kind of semiotics and uh, you know, theory of new media around 1991, that's also at least 10 years before it became popular. So what I can tell you again, that's kind of my prediction, is that at some point in the future, you know, you not necessarily will be replaced by AI system, but you will be working together with AI systems. And the more you know about them, the more you know how we program, right? The more you understand statistics, uh, machine learning, uh, and so on, right? The more successful you can be, and at least you will not be replaced. So some of you perhaps will be participating in projects along with uh, scientists to program, right, to, to refine future AI systems. Uh, some of you will be fine-tuning parameters. Some of you may be using the future neural networks and training them. So we can create projects in your style, or perhaps you'll be using these neural networks to challenge yourself. Um, so what I think uh, we, we will, we, what I think should happen is that, you know, we need to start new programs where education in uh, statistics, uh, mathematics, calculus, computer science, and data science is given equal attention to education in creative fields, right? So I can imagine a future, you know, a bachelor and master's program in industrial design and computer science, communication design and computer science, media creation and computer science, fashion design and computer science, and so on. Right, because ultimately, you know, it's possible to get grants, it's possible to be invited in different labs. But you know, today, I think the creative people and the scientists speak very different languages. And if you at least know a real language, you can be much more successful in communication in leading uh, kind of creative projects as opposed to simply providing data to these neural networks. Okay, so let's now talk about AI, right? Uh, so one thing I want to do today is to take this term, right, which became maybe too popular, right, too fashionable. Uh, like, you know, every time I open, you know, New York Times or Financial Times or Deutsche Welle, right, or other kind of uh, large, respected global media, right, you know, the terms AI or neural networks or machine learning on every page. So let's take this term mm -hmm. and uh, maybe divide it into different categories to better also understand what AI means for culture and design. Uh, so this is one way, right, to take this term and divide it into five different types of AI. So if we can think of AI as simply improvements of already existing functions and techniques, uh, which today typically uses machine learning, but tomorrow maybe using our approaches. So for example, Photoshop, right, already for, for a long time, uh, has a tool which allows right uh, Photoshop to like automatically right detect like you know maybe the head right in the photograph and make a mask around this head right to mask the object like maybe ten years ago you had to draw this mask by hand and then at some point Photoshop added right a bit of computation to be able to kind of automatically refine the edge and at some point it simply switched to neural networks. So from point of view of user, nothing changed, right? The tool interface, the way tool is presented to you, right? Nothing changed, but it simply became a bit more efficient because now it's based on neural networks. So that's one use of AI where on the surface, right? Nothing changes, but instead of using some classical kind of deterministic algorithms, which reach to uh, pre-train neural networks, which simply make operation of a tool or function more successful. Another type of AI is what I call classical AI, because that's how AI was defined in the 1950s, which is automation of a single human cognition. Right? So the idea is that we can automate the human, but human understood as a kind of cognitive, right, very rational kind of person, right, uh, a being. So we can automate things like what we think as achievements of human cognition, planning, for example, automatic driving, like driving a car, right? I know, playing piano or playing chess, 
uh, translating from one language to another, right? and so on and so forth. Another term, which I will, another type of AI, which I'll talk about in a second, is what I call supercognition. But we can also talk about, in relation to culture, about aesthetic AI, and also design AI. And I will unpack these terms in a second. So uh, let's talk about improvement of existing functions, because this is, in a way, right, the most common use of AI, uh, right? There are thousands of places where your laptop or your iPad, uh, your tablet, right, or your phone is using AI, and most of this play, most, right, most of it's invisible to you. Like, for example, when you start using your phone keyboard, right, maybe first when you type keys, right, the keyboard and the phone is very small. So it's very easy to miss the keys and you do lots of typos, but some, right, some program is watching you and it's basically figuring it out that, you know, when you type, a, type the screen in a particular area, like it looks like in reality, right? You type P, but you actually you actually meant N, and it's going to type N, right? So the program is watching, learning from you, even basically improving the success of your typing, right? Now we think about this idea, the improvement of existing functions, is that it's very hard to say conceptually what is AI and what's not AI, uh, because when we think about this term, artificial intelligence. You know, but are endless things today which computers do are intelligent. So, for example, the computer may be monitoring use of different applications and then uh, optimizing the use of memory so your battery lasts longer. Is this intelligent? Is this AI or not? Kind of impossible to say. It really depends on your definition, right? So I think conceptually it's kind of impossible to separate where we have AI where we have artificial intelligence and where we simply have algorithm, right? And as I said, uh, one example is improving kind of separation of figure from background in Photoshop, right? You know, and sometimes, of course, designers add new functions. So for example, the latest, right, the latest Apple Watch 6, right, has an app which basically detects, right, when you're washing hands, it reminds you to wash for 20 seconds or 30 seconds well, is this intelligent? Is it artificial intelligence? You know, it's kind of hard to say, right? Depends on your, depends on your definition of what intelligence is. And the historians of AI talk about something which we call AI effect, right? Artificial intelligence effect. So uh, we noted when, when some AI problem was solved, it's no longer seen as part of AI. So until a few years ago, Right, AI has been around since the 50s, so for 70 years, but for most of this period, AI was always critiqued, right, as being not too successful, it's promising too much, not delivering. And the reason was, actually, it was successful very often, but the moment it became successful in solving some problem, this problem was no longer, right, seen as a part of AI. So maybe when new Apple Watch comes out and now there is this app, which is, oh my God, the Apple Watch is so intelligent, right? It can detect when you wash hands and tell you to wash hands for 30 seconds, but maybe after six months, we so much get used to it. You know, we don't think that there's anything special about this app, okay? Now, I already talked about the classical AI, right? Uh, this idea which emerges in the mid 1950s uh, in America, in UK, also in, uh, in Russia was uh, kind of automation of human cognition, right? So basically the idea was to automate the kind of cognitive functions, which a single human being can do. Uh, and it is this automation which became much more successful, right? In some ways uh, in the last, you know, five, six, seven years, for example, language translation, maybe you notice how Google Translate is becoming more and more successful. Understanding content of text, that depends, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, computer vision, so recognition of contents, type of objects, type of scenes, uh, photo techniques in the image. So one example is, right, autocomplete in Gmail. So autocomplete function was introduced first in mobile version, I think about three years ago. And um, two years ago, I remember a talk of somebody from Google, and she said that already like 13% of uh, all you know, Gmail sent on the phone, we're using autocomplete. 
And, uh, you know, I use it all the time, right? And every time I use it, I feel kind of guilty, right? Because I feel like, well, actually, I'm not really thinking, right? The AI is thinking for me. Yeah. So then I also mentioned this idea of supercognition. Yeah. So it's kind of my term, but I think other people maybe have similar terms. So I think what happens in the uh, last 20 years is the move from uh, automation of a single mind to what I call supercognition, where AI is not simply, again, automating what one human being can do. Right? It's not simply competing with human beings in terms of playing Go, playing chess, but in fact, it creates a kind of supercognition, right? It creates a new phenomena, right? a new type of cognition, so to speak, which can solve tasks which are impossible for a human being because of the scale of data. So think, for example, about web search or web recommendations, right? You type something in your search engine and uh, it goes for an index, right, of billions of web pages or billions of images or billions of videos. And uh, in right, dozens of milliseconds, it shows you the pages which it thinks are most relevant and most of the time it works, right? It will be very hard to imagine even if you have 10, 100,000 human beings be able to do that, right? So simply physically, you know, even if you put 1,000 human beings, right, I don't think they'll be able to uh, kind of find results in 20 milliseconds, but also we will not be able to process like millions of search, search, right, of search queries happening every minute, right? So I think that the supercognition, right, is a kind of our society's response to a new scale of data and culture. But maybe it's not necessarily the only way, and maybe it's kind of fail, maybe it represents a kind of failure of our uh, technical and cultural imagination to imagine a different response. So what do I mean by this? Um, so the web, right, uh, starts to become popular in 93. Right? The number of web pages grows. In 2002, you have Wikipedia. Uh, then 2006, right, 2007, you have social media, right? So, you know, maybe already a few years ago, you know, there are estimates that on Facebook alone, right, people share 2 billion images every day, like 100, million images on Instagram and so on and so forth, right? And, uh, you know, we need a way, right, to find relevant data. So the way our society, right, kind of approaches this problem is by, uh, intra right, by kind of scaling up things like recommendation and also search, right? So you go, for example, to Amazon, right? And, uh, you know, you find a book and then out of millions of books or other products sold on Amazon, Amazon says, here's five other books or here's five other, uh, you know, music records or here's five other, I don't know, toothbrushes, you know, which you think you would like, right? So the idea is that it does some computation behind the scene and then instead of showing you, right, all these millions of possibilities, it shows you a very, very tiny island, right? A very tiny portion, just a few things which it thinks is most relevant because few things you can look at, right? The same thing about web search, right? So when you do web search, you know, sometimes, right, Google or, or you know, or Bing, right, or some other search engine will say, well, actually I found one, you know, 1.5 million pages and it shows you the pages, but of course nobody is going to go to page two or page three of a search, right? You're just basically going to click on the first few results on page one. Right. But maybe this is not the only way to do it. So maybe our computer scientists and also our designers and actually people like you, right? Uh, young designers have to think about a different approach. Maybe the goal of design should be to create an alternative paradigm, right? To create a kind of interfaces which will not hide, right? All this complexity and all this multitude of information and only show people like few things which the computer things are most relevant but somehow kind of show everything, but only show everything in a kind of different interface, right? Show everything in such a way that we can navigate it uh, in some very efficient way and see more as opposed to only be presented with what computer selected for us. How to do it, you know, I don't know. I mean, it can be a whole different lecture. We can talk about history of interfaces, right? We can talk about cinema. Cinema editing is interface. We can talk about 
Giotto, you know, and uh, Renaissance Italian painting with interfaces to story, right? Uh, as I pointed out in some of my writings, the history of culture is the history of creation of interfaces to information. When you think about beginning of 20th century, the new artistic techniques of um, collage and montage, uh, right, work of Picasso, Braque, Rochenko, Lisitsky, and so on, uh, the society was also going through explosion of information right, similar to our period, but maybe even more. Uh, and um, I think the artists develop, right, very powerful visual and spatial techniques, right, compositional techniques, organizational techniques, techniques for organizing sequences, techniques for organizing elements in space, such as montage, right, to somehow collapse the information, to aggregate the information, and present it in some kind of digestible way. Uh, but today, if you look at uh, these kind of photo collages, right, from 1920s, you'll see that they're not so complex. Maybe at maximum, we may have 20, 30 elements. So it's a bit like maybe, you know, a Google search engine, which only shows you 10 pages out of many, many pages which are relevant. Uh, you know, there has been also many attempts to create kind of three-dimensional interfaces, this idea goes back to Neuromancer by William Gibson, right? Cyberpunk literature from the 1980s. This idea that you kind of somehow fly for this web of information and find what you need, but it also doesn't work because walking or flying virtually takes time, right? So how do you kind of expect, how do you navigate for millions of information items if you imitate physical walking, driving or flying? So it's definitely a very hard problem. In fact, the problem is so hard, but I think our society hasn't really tried to solve it. And, and instead, you know, we're now in this paradigm of web searches and recommendations, where it basically filters everything out and just shows you a few things. But how to really deal with complexity and with abundance of choices, I think it's a very big problem. It may be one of the biggest problems for design in our era. So finally, we come to the realm of culture, right? Uh, so we're talking about now aesthetic AI. Uh, so this is something which, uh, in terms of art, already maybe emerges in the late 1950s and 1960s, where first very small number of artists are using algorithms uh, to program artworks. The first artist to use proper AI was Harold Coyne. Uh, he was a British painter when he became professor at the University of California, San Diego in uh, 68. In 1971, he was uh, invited to Stanford and he worked with uh, where, you know, uh, where Artificial Intelligence Lab. And he we wrote some programs for him and he was known as the first artist uh, which, was using which was using computer programs in this, which would basically create first drawings and later paintings in his style, right? So this idea, which is very popular today, using particular type of artificial neural networks such as GANs, right? Where you take a photograph and you translate it into a, what looks like a painting in a particular style, but he was doing it already in the early seventies and he spent his whole life basically refining this one program. Uh, but what happens in the 2010s, right? In the last 10 years, is with aesthetic AI kind of moves right from realm to art to the realm of mass culture, right? And it's now being integrated just as the church recommendations, right? Throughout contemporary uh, digital culture. And here are very interesting examples. Um, so if you look at the evolution of computer vision, already uh, many years ago, right? Uh, the computer scientists started to teach computers how to recognize instances of various objects and type of scenes, right, in the image. And, uh, but about, I think in 2016, I noticed first applications, first commercial applications of a new paradigm, where using, again, supervised neural networks, uh, where computers are taught not only to find, to detect type of objects in the image, not only type of let's say, uh, maybe high-level concepts, not only types of photographic techniques, but also to give images a static score, right? And this comes from like a real website of, uh, I think, a uh, company, I think it's IEM. So it's started, we started as a kind of 
a social media company like Flickr, but then we changed a few years ago. So now we also have, like we sell stock images to agencies. And when you search by stock images, you can search not only by content, but you can also search by static score, right? And here are examples from website of this company. So on the one side, right, we have this very kind of cute image of a cat, right? Uh, holding, right, uh, a kind of toy animal. And we see the kind of keywords which computer uh, assigned to this image, right? So some of these keywords concern content, such as pets, young animal, whisker, animal head, right? Uh, our keywords are kind of, right, verbs, the activities like relaxation and sleeping, right? Still our keywords describe and the photographic, right, photographic parameters, photographic techniques, such as focus on the foreground, selective focus, close up, right? But also what we see, and this is more recent, right? This is still not part of like most, uh, it's not part of Google Photos or Apple Photos, right? This is not really mainstream yet, and maybe it will not become mainstream, but it is already available in some software as a static score, right? Uh, so on the other side, right, we have photograph of this kind of happy, good-looking dude, right, young guy with a surfboard, and uh, there are also keywords like portrait, summer sunglasses, and then we see with the computer things that the photograph of this cat or animal, the static score is only forty percent, but the static score for this person is eighty-five percent, and we start wondering, right, why it is. Well. Um, so one thing about this teaching computer, right, how to score images aesthetically or videos or books and so on, is that, uh, you know, as we know, right, from taking classes in visual communication or history, simulated and so on, the perception, the reception is subjective, right? You, everybody can see the same image differently. What you see in this image, you know, how you analyze it, what science you detect, right, how this image affects you, may depend on your background, right? So for example, people who study art and design, we literally see images differently uh, with a psychological research, which uh, supports this idea, right? We see kind of formal structure, composition, colors, whereas most people who don't have uh, some kind of art, design, photography training, actually mostly see the content. We computers were seeing images maybe 15 years ago. Uh, but uh, so what's what is right? What is strange about kind of right about this automatic aesthetic scores is it implies that there is some kind of universal aesthetic response, right? Uh, very much maybe along the lines of Immanuel Kant aesthetics in the 18th century, right? So the idea that this image universally is has a high aesthetic score with that image. But I think that's problematic, right? So I, I'm hoping that in the future we'll start start like start seeing more sophisticated systems, which will somehow take into account uh, different types of audiences, right? Different types of subjects. But then how do you right? But then how do you employ them in the industry? How do you employ them practically, right? Um, and so that's an interesting question. And another question we can ask here is why this image of this guy with, with, with a surfboard, right? Why the computer likes it more than the animal? Uh, so I have some idea because, you know, I have some idea how the systems work. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse, me. Excuse me. Sorry. Good thing you're not sitting next to me, so. And Valentina, everything is okay with sound? Yeah, everything okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah so Perfect. I think, you know, yeah, so I think that, um, Right, so there are two ways in which you can kind of teach with systems, right? You can either explicitly program some rules of a good photography, which are described in various professional photo books or photo manuals or tutorials, or you can have you know hundreds of thousands and millions of images, and you can have professional photographers, right? Or people score with images, like one to five or one to 10, and then you can simply feed these images into the network and um, the network itself will kind of figure out, right? Automatically, what are the properties of images uh, which lead to high scores, right? Uh, so I don't know, right? We probably use the second method, but the result is the same. Um, 
so for example, this image of a guy, right? You can see how it kind of follows the so-called rule of thirds, right? See, if you divide this image uh, into kind of three parts, horizontally and vertically, you can see how important points, right? Important edges of composition like right? fit onto this grid, uh, right? That's one thing. Uh, the second thing, right, with the kind of, everything is in focus, right, with the clear background. So this image is kind of in a way faster to read. Uh, whereas the image, right, of the cat and the young animal, which I think is actually much more interesting, right, and quite sophisticated, but maybe it does take like an extra, you know, half a second to process. Um, and, you know, uh, the, depth, the depth relationship are maybe also not as clear, right? So if you focus, if you can really paying attention, you see what it is, but if you're just wandering in the upper part of this image, maybe it becomes a bit confusing what's in the foreground and background, so maybe the software didn't like that, right? So again, from a point of view of photographic rules, right, or this very simplistic rules of what made a good photograph, this image of a person with surfboard is better, right? But I think you know, for most, for many of us, this image of a, the subway image of a cat, the animal is actually statically more interesting, right? So you can see how already uh, what the computer kind of learns, right? It's some kind of perhaps oversimplifying, right? And too universalizing idea of aesthetics. Uh, and uh, if everybody, right, if people start use this aesthetics course, right, then they select images, for example, to use in very graphic designs, posters, catalogs, and so on, right? Uh, it can lead, right, to in fact, more simplistic um, uh, more you know, more images being used, right? And instead of like visual diversity, we, we may get uh, more and more monotony. Okay. Um, so another right. So, so this is so here we talked about right kind of AI uh, looking at culture and uh, trying to understand what it is and trying to judge it, so to speak, right? So the so the computer is now acting as a static subject. And of course, another thing, uh, which we can also use AI uh, in culture, design, architecture, and film is to generate things, right? So for example, you probably know the famous case where I think it was six or seven years ago, the producers at Netflix, right? Have had their data team use AI, uh, which supposedly, right? Automatically kind of created a script for Game of Thrones but if you look if you look at articles about it right it's not so sophisticated it basically right look at right, hundreds of thousands of various uh tv shows and also all the net all the netflix offerings and basically made some recommendations right to so say well you know this so plot about this this kind of plot would be more popular this actors would be more popular so it's basically rated possible plots and possible actors right so it rated the elements of a TV show in terms of like what potential will be more successful. But at the end, the producers use their intuition and their experience, right? Work in a TV and a broadcast and uh, media production for many years to actually make final choices, right? So we I hadn't redesigned uh, Game of Thrones, uh, but in the future you can imagine it will. Now to me, of course, it's a bit strange and this is again my own sensibility, my own opinions, right? So I know Netflix is very popular, and sometimes when I feel tired, right, I want to go and I want to watch some Netflix shows, and now Netflix produces, right, hundreds of their own original shows in many languages, right? So we sponsor shows produced in Japan, in Korea, in China, in France. And I don't know about you, but personally, I can maybe maximum watch like one or two episodes, and then like I feel like the whole thing is designed by computer, uh, and I just switched on, and when I watch some kind of social media, which is a bit more unpredictable. Um, so for me, right, lots of this kind of uh, very sophisticated, very professionally done commercial culture is already algorithmic in the sense that it seems to follow certain rules, but more importantly, everything is optimized, right? Every glance, you know, every composition, you know, every part of a plot, right? Everything is optimized to keep your in suspense, right, to the game maximum entertainment and to kind of go from one shot to another to lead it from a narrative. Uh, and uh, it's a particular kind of, let's say, meta-aesthetics 
which uh, in fact was a trademark of uh, Hollywood for many, many decades, uh, which I think you can find today also in, in most of Netflix shows, regardless of where we're produced, but maybe just my kind of older modernist avant-garde sensibility, which doesn't like it, maybe for you, you know, the shows look perfect and sophisticated and not boring, right? So it's really a matter of taste. Uh, so some more examples, right? Some more examples of, you know, contemporary use of AI. Um, so this is a Luminar, right? Luminar AI. So Luminar is a, one of the leading photo editors along with Photoshop. Uh, and we already had a product for a few years. Uh, so this is from existing products and uh, very new product Luminar AI is I think coming out later this year. Uh, so in terms of incorporation of AI in photo editing, it's uh, probably most sophisticated, right? Product today, although Photoshop is now catching up. So Photoshop is going to release, for example, automatic sky replacement, right? And the idea is to automate, right? Photographic editing. Uh, so for example, here is AI structure, one of our tools, right? You basically select, right? How much structure you want. And then the, you know, it goes through your photograph and it doesn't enhance everything, but it only enhances parts of the image, which it thinks, right? Uh, needs to be enhancing. And again, you start wondering, right? What's going to be the cultural and aesthetic effect of a mass use of these tools? Because until recently, these kind of automatic tools were actually part not of professional software, but amateur software, right? So Google Photos, Apple Photos would, you know, Google Photos would automatically offer to enhance your photos. And there are thousands of photo apps uh, on uh, uh, Android store, right? Uh, and uh, uh, right for Android and for uh, iOS, but most of the apps were used by amateurs. But now I see kind of very professional photographers, right? People who like, usually review very expensive lenses and very expensive cameras are now reviewing these applications on their YouTube channels and saying, I'm also going to use these applications, right? So of course, I think the danger, right, is obvious. Uh, it becomes impossible to make imperfect images, right? It becomes impossible to imagine something which is not perfect, something which is not optimized. And uh, uh, I think there are two problems here, right? One is that all photographs, right, may start looking a bit the same, like everything is high contrast, everything is saturated, everything has this perfect dramatic sky. Uh, and uh, another problem is that everything becomes just perfect, right? That's of course not the new development, uh, it already starts with photo editors and Photoshop in the 1990s. And of course, this idea, right, for perfection, uh, to create a product which has kind of perfect appearance, is not limited to digital culture. So think about plastic surgery and cosmetic, right? Cosmetic, uh, cos you know, various cosmetic procedures and think about makeup, right? So the use of makeup is as old as humanity. But for example, this year I'm living right in Korea, and uh, you know it, it depends on the place. But for example, places like basically you know in, in big cities, seventy percent of young females have some kind of plastic surgery, and also lots of lots of young guys. And you know how we perfect look because if you can look at K-pop, right? Korean uh, you know, music videos, which are now more popular worldwide than Hollywood. So you go outside, you go to cafes, right? You walk in the streets, you're surrounded by these really kind of perfect faces. And sometimes we're all a bit similar to each other and it's very pleasurable, but it's also very strange as though you're like in some kind of like, you know, weird dream, yeah? right? And here is the digital version of it, right? So it's also from Luminar, uh, right? Again, you can remove red eye, right? You can whiten teeth, uh, you can uh, remove dark circles, right? So, and uh, this, kind of right the use of advanced makeup and cosmetic surgery and various co cosmetic procedures right uh, which i also do from time to time because i have to study this industry right it, in a way parallels uh, the emergence and the development of these tools in digital culture now uh, outside the photography right and filmmaking uh, another area which may may wonder right where we may see more ai uh, would be, uh, for example, uh, creation of automatic data visualization. So this hasn't entered mainstream yet, but uh, in the last five years, we have been already a number of project, projects in research labs, 
and um, experimental experimental right software, uh, which automatically right creates data visualizations. But data visualizations themselves can be kind of simple, but what's important is that the intel where artificial intelligence which goes right into analyzing the data and suggesting which visualizations can be uh, should be made. Uh, and then here's, for example, automatic editing of footage from multiple social camera. So how do I follow this research? I mean, I read lots of research papers, which I find on Google Scholar. Uh, I mean, I look at thousands of papers every year. I don't necessarily read all of them, right? I simply can look at the, you know, I look at the pictures, I look at the abstract. Uh, so I can follow what people present at computer science, you know, AI, computer vision conferences. Because usually these techniques, if they're best techniques, end up in commercial software, hardware, you know, within a few years. And uh, here's, for example, right, and, and where people invent more and more ways to use AI, right? So here's, for example, we say, you know, if you go to some popular event, like a club, right? Uh, well, in, in, in 2019, right, not right now, like to club event or maybe some famous lecture, right? People sometimes shoot it from different perspectives. Right, and we put these videos online, so you can find these videos. And then the idea: can you edit like a one video using footage, right, of multiple people? And the reason I'm showing you this is that that's an example of how not all creative AI is always using neural networks, right? So sometimes you know creative AI is also programmed using explicit rules, right? So here, for example, you know, we took explicit uh film editing rules you know which you can right pick up from any film textbook and uh, they program these rules right so for example there is a rule to avoid jump cuts right there is a rule to follow there is a 180 degree rule which is used in editing dialogues so then the idea is to kind of create the system which actually follows rules so here are more examples right of aesthetic in design ai uh for example, Google Clips, right, was released a couple of years ago. So the idea you have a camera which is sitting at home. You don't program it, but it's been trained by, again, uh, by right, it has a neural network. So automatically, kind of, it's trying to find what happens in your home, it automatically captures the footage, and automatically tries to edit the meaningful videos of your family, right? Uh, and of course, one area where AI has been used perhaps most systematically for many years has been video games, right? So the creation of video game characters, right? So-called non-human characters, right? And also the automatic generation of worlds uh, in response to play action. Okay. Uh, so I think the interesting question, right? Uh, I mean, there are many questions here, right? But one question which has always been in my head for over 30 years, you know, as I've been kind of studying, following, and, and participating right, in digital culture myself, right? so I learned how algorithms work, and also realized that algorithms can be applied to media already in the 1980s, like uh, very, very early. Uh, and all these years, I was asking myself, not... I was not asking myself, will something be one day automated? But I was asking myself, why something hasn't yet been automated? So why not? Well, uh, what will, what you learn, right, from semiotics and theory of film and television, media studies, theory of literature, right, uh, history of design, is that there is no such thing as complete originality, right? Nobody starts from scratch. This myth that everybody is creative, it's a complete myth, right? Everybody starts with some existing examples, templates, conventions, techniques, right? And most people, including most creatives, are simply copy what already exists, right? Uh, right? Not everybody can invent new things, and there's nothing wrong with copy, right? If, especially if you think about the history of modern culture, the history of classical culture, both in the East and the West, it was about copying, right? We basically go to you become a young student in some artist workshop and you copy things for years, right? Before you allow to paint something yourself, right? And medieval monks, you know, are copying manuscripts and maybe adding something in the footnotes, right? The copy can be also a creative process if you add something. 
right? And then some people, very small percentage, we can kind of combine existing techniques, existing elements, and create new hybrid and new remixes, which are maybe more original. And there is new remixes of hybrids are somehow culturally valuable, like the culture can pick them up, and they also will be duplic duplicated. So you can think about evolution of culture you know, in a kind of biological terms, right, using biological metaphors. And then there are some people who maybe use existing elements, but we create something which is genuinely new. This happens very, very rarely, right? It doesn't happen often at all. And these are people, at least until now, who really remember, right, who uh, enter kind of the grand history of culture. And if you think about, you know, how many artists do we remember from 19th century? Not good artists, but really pioneering artists. A, ha a handful, right? How many artists we remember from 20th century out of million artists which existed? Again, right, not a very small number. Uh, the same goes for architecture, film, the music, and so on. Right, so lots of people can do something which is good, but not, not original, professional, but not amazing. And only very few people, right, can do something amazing. Now, so that's one thing, right? The second thing is think about, again, commercial culture. Uh, you know, think about, again, right, lots of like web designs for big companies, uh, Netflix, Netflix TV series, uh, right, big budget films, uh, the kind of novels, right, the kind of novels, you know, romances, so the airport and so on, right? But what we learn from humanities is that we all follow certain templates, right, where a particular plot lines, right, where particular compositions, uh, for example, with the rule of third, right, in photography, and uh, these kind of deep structures, right, with repeating structures are at the heart of, you know, a, a very large proportion of contemporary mass culture. And uh, the film scholars, you know, semioticians, art historians, literary scholars, architecture scholars, and so on, right, have already for many, many decades, maybe for 100 years or 50, 70 years, have described the structures, right, in their books. So the question is, you know, why not take these descriptions and kind of put them, right, in the software and start automatically creating novels, uh, films, TV series, photographs, uh, chairs, lamps, you know, uh, interiors of hotels, uh, design of storefronts, you know, and then maybe, uh, you know, that's, we don't need any humans, right? And again, this is the example, right? So here, you know, we're taking some rules, right, of filmmaking and putting these rules on software. So why people have not been doing it for decades? Uh, why it didn't happen, right? And this is, I think, one of the kind of, right, uh, you know, very big questions, which maybe we can discuss it a bit, uh, you know, in the question answer uh, part. Uh, and then, um, and then I guess, you know, one more question which I have, right? So I already mentioned a few times, but I kind of want to summarize it, which is cultural effects of aesthetic and design AI. So does this automation in a cultural sphere, which is gradually increasing, right? Is it going to contribute to gradual decrease of cultural diversity and variability, right? Is it going to make uh, global culture more like monoculture? Or is it, going to incre incre is it going to increase diversity and variability? And uh, what's interesting to me about this question is not necessarily have some kind of critique, right? Is not to be very enthusiastic and to say, yes, it's going to make a world more diverse because more people will be recommended more different things. Or to say, no, the world will become less diverse because everybody will be recommended the same thing. Everybody's photographs will be edited to become perfect. What's interesting to me is that in order to answer these kind of questions, we have to think about how to measure cultural diversity and cultural variability for different types of media and design, right? So for example, if you look at, you know, all the chairs, you know, uh, all the, right, all the furniture being produced by IKEA today versus all the furniture being sold by IKEA five years ago. Is it more diverse? Is it less diverse? If you look at all the sports shoes, right, produced by different companies, you know, Nike, Adidas, New Balance, and so on, 
and you look at this over time, right? How do you measure, for example, variability and diversity of the shoes, right? And to me, these are very interesting questions. Why? Because uh, even though I don't always talk about this, in my heart, in my soul, I am a semiotician, right? Uh, in fact, uh, so I try to think about the structures, uh, the relationships inside culture, and I try to have some kind of formal systematic theory about it. And uh, because today, right, the culture is so, right, we have so many options, right? We have so many, we have so many different images, clothes, and so on, right? There are so many offerings. Uh, it's kind of impossible, I think, to describe contemporary culture using language. Right? And I'll give you some examples at the end, right? Uh, let me just keep all this. So whole hour, second part of the lecture. This is some projects of my own. Oops. Okay, let me just. Okay. You can find all these projects on our, our, my website, manage.net and also website of my lab, uh, culturalanalytic.info. But, uh, but I want to show you some things, right? So when I started to think about these images, uh, so these questions, after I already was engaged with uh, learning AI, learning data science, learning statistics, learning computer vision, and trying to use them to study culture, right? to do a kind of computational semiotics, so to speak, um, I started to wonder uh, about the problems in this approach. And this is, in a way, right, kind of my test case. So I selected, right, so I noticed around five years ago that uh, as, the, uh, as the resolution of uh, uh, phone cameras became sufficient and uh, the speed, right, of networks increased, uh, hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of young people started to create very sophisticated like a photo galleries on Instagram. So Instagram has really became, right, uh, not only a place where you find kind of boring photographs of burgers or pasta, whatever people eat, and it's not only a place for celebrities and famous people. You know, it's also a kind of, right, a huge museum, a huge gallery of uh, young people in their 20s, of thirties and sometimes in very teens, sometimes even teenagers, who basically put their photographs, right? And some of these people have you know, millions of followers, some of these people have five thousand followers, some of these people may have five hundred followers, but with lots of them, right? And I will show you examples of these accounts from five years ago. And I specifically right selected these accounts you know, not from Italy, not from France, not from America, but from other countries, right? Um, perhaps from places where aesthetics is also very important, right? So this is quite big examples of photographs selected from accounts of people, right? I just selected on Instagram, right? So from each person, I selected uh, like six photographs, right? So you have six, 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 right? I'm not saying these are great photographs. I'm not saying they're amazing photographs, but each of these each of his people, right? Each of these accounts has a particular style, a particular language. In 2015, the word theme wasn't yet popular, right? Now we can say it's a theme, but it's not simply, right? Automatic, almost mechanical application of some filters uh, or some other templates, right? With something happening, I think, in each of these accounts. Uh, and each of them is different, right? And each, uh, the photographs that belong to each account, they are different from each other, right? But they're also different from other account. So we can think about differences between these photo galleries and also the differences inside. And while you can start analyzing this in terms of templates and particular compositions and particular color palettes, right, there's something else. And the something else is a mystery of art, photography, design, and visual communication. Something else is the same mystery which uh, semiotics project run across, I think, around 1970, uh, is that uh, we don't really know, right? How images, for example, but also our cultural project, but in this case, we don't really know how images create meaning. And maybe meaning is not the right term. Maybe maybe it doesn't make sense to talk about meanings, 
you know, maybe these photographs make us feel, but maybe feeling is also a wrong term uh, because contemporary psychology uh, distinguishes between seven or eight emotions. And I think there are many more kind of emotional states, feelings. Uh, I don't even know how to call it, right? Uh, which these images create. And, uh, you know, there are now millions, right? Many millions of these images on Instagram, right? And of course, this is not new, but I think uh, 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago, we're not so many artists, right? Uh, we're not so many people which were able to produce with kind of images, this very sophisticated aesthetics, this nuance. But today, there are millions and millions of people, right, who can do it. And because we use digital tools, and we can also learn from each other, right? And if you go to YouTube, there are millions of tutorials, right? How to edit your images, how to Photoshop your images, how to create Instagram themes so people don't have to go to school, right? We don't need to go and pay money for some design academy. We can learn themselves up to a point, right? There are so many of these people. So if I want to have some kind of map, right? If I want to have some kind of uh, a virtual museum, right? Where I would put all these photographs and all these accounts, and I want to maybe organize it by similarities and differences and types of feelings. Can I use computers to do it? Right? I definitely can do it by hand because there are so many photographs, right? there are so many accounts. And the same thing, of course, goes for illustrations and uh, digital paintings and all, all other kinds of cultural artifacts. Right? So my dream has to been to do it algorithmically. And uh, as computational resources right, became available, and as the AI is going forward, somewhat becomes possible. But at the same time, I became more and more attuned, right? And more and more, uh, kind of more and more realized that we actually don't know how images work. We don't really know what's important. Uh, you know, the effect of each of this image is not only its content, it's not only its formal structure, but it depends on our experience on being in the world, right? So just as this idea of general artificial intelligence remains to be unreachable because you can kind of transfer right, lots of knowledge into the computer, but you can't transfer having a body, having eyes, living in the world, right? At least for now, it's unreachable. So there are some things computers can do, but other things we're completely blind to. And even if they can do some things, you know, we don't really understand what we're doing, we can simulating intelligence, right? Uh, to me, this kind of photographs, right? And I can also use, of course, fashion or design or architecture, but I just happen to like images and photography. It's a kind of challenge, right? Mm -hmm. To development of aesthetic artificial intelligence. And uh, what I want to say is with why this is important, because I think today we have so many photographers and so many artists and so many graphic designers just go to, I mean, go to Behance, right? There are millions of wonderful portfolios better than yours, right? But so many people today in, in creative fields. You know, we're at something like uh, 30 million registered users of Adobe products, and maybe another 100 people who are not registered, right? So you're competing against millions of people, right? And because there are so many offerings, people start creating their aesthetics, right? Not using some big difference, but using some very small nuance. So if you go to some you know, store, like you go to Muji, for example, right? The popular Japanese kind of minimalist store, right? Or here I am in Korea where minimalism is kind of default, right? So I can go to the store, you know, which may offer 100 you know, white t-shirts, but every t-shirt is a bit unique, right? Different, different tone of white, different texture, different material. And um, I'm not sure I can teach computer, right? We can separate them, right? Uh, because the difference can be like 1%. So uh, it's very really easy, right, to have, it's, at this point, it's very really easy to have a computer say, okay, this is photograph of a forest, this is photograph, you know, this is like some gifts, this is a glasses, this is a hand. But how do you uh, code dozens of other invisible, hard to describe, hard to understand dimensions, which kind of separate these photographs uh, and which makes some photographs uh, Kind of more relevant to us as opposed to as opposed to not, right? That's to me is a kind of challenge of aesthetic AI. How do you understand nuances? And why you have to understand nuances? Because contemporary culture, because of its abundance, 
does operate on nuances as opposed to juxtapositions, right? So montage, juxtapositions of opposites was the kind of governing logic of culture in the 20th century. I think contemporary, large, contemporary culture is about nuance, right? It's about just the right shade of white. It's about you know, slight shadow in the background, right? It's about just slight you know, uh, angle, just, just 1% different angle of a line. So to be able to teach your computer to understand these nuances is perhaps the key uh, to both more successful aesthetic artificial intelligence, but also perhaps will help us to understand how culture works and how culture work in general uh, will help understand the project of visual semiotics and cultural field in general. So I will done, I will stop sharing and uh, I hope we'll have some energy and time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lev, for this uh, very rich uh, lecture with a bunch of interesting topics to explore. So it could be impossible for me, of course, just to cover all that topics. We will wait for questions. But uh, mm -hmm. for now, um, I start. Uh, with a question okay. for you. Oh, oh. So, okay. I'm uh, okay. I, I was just trying to find actually. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to see with the chat. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, please. It, okay. No, that's uh, okay. I just wanted to open the chat in case there are questions. Yes. Ah, okay, okay. perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. But maybe it's okay. So to start by this one. So uh, okay. you were talking about uh, how algorithms and AI are now a very concrete part of the culture productions in any in any level. Uh, in my perspective, um, maybe we could say that AI has been introducing a sort of new kind of actions, a new kind of actors in the world, if you want. Uh, I was thinking about uh, Bruno Latour, of course. I'm quoting Bruno Latour and semiotic, um, mm -hmm. semiotics um, regarding all that. So we have... Uh, non-human actors such as mm -hmm. AI algorithms, AI techniques that are designed by humans, of course, in order to do something, in order yes. to perform tasks uh, as a very specific response, as you said uh, very well, to uh, this new scale of data. So um, we need to face uh, the big data in some way. Um, that is, they perform impossible tasks for humans uh, because they are um, designed to do that. Uh, so they act and works, uh, but um, their thinking and the way they do, uh, all they do is completely invisible to us in, as, uh, um, as human beings and of course as uh, um, the final um, uh, the final consumers in some way of all that. Uh, you were talking about all that in terms of the large, the very large uh, AI's black box. It, it's a very interesting topic, I think. So my question is, uh, new design disciplines and the new design approaches could help us to look inside that black box of algorithms and of AI uh, it seems to be very interesting. So new AI will eventually give rise uh, to new design disciplines. Um, so yeah, very, very, thank you. Very incredibly rich and very interesting comments. So first of all, you're absolutely right. It's a brilliant point about uh, Bruno Latour, right? His idea of the kind of right, act, act, act and networks. So yeah. his idea that there are humans, with the humans, we're kind of non-human such as animals, but also machines can kind of form the networks, mm -hmm. right? I think, you know, I think the reason this, his idea became so popular, most people most people don't use his ideas creatively, right? Like mm -hmm. I almost never see really interesting application of his idea, but I think maybe his idea is a kind of metaphor, right? It's a perfect metaphor for our mm. time. Mm. Then our production, creative, entertainment, and social life, Right, we're so much we're so much connected to all kinds of machines, systems, networks, neural networks, interfaces, and so on. Right, so we can mm. say that Karl Marx, right, in his idea that the economic production is at the center of life and it's about who owns the means of production. Again, most of his analysis was also incorrect, 
as mm-hmm. uh, late economists have shown, but in a way, by putting focus, right, on kind of who owns the means of production, he kind of captured something about middle of 19th century, right? Mm-hmm. And we can see Latour captures something, right, very precisely with his general idea about the world that's after 1980 and after 1990, when, uh, right, a uh, lot more and more countries become as advanced societies of quality of labor, right? But even if you go to a farm, right, the farmers use drones and AI, right? Mm. I mean, you basically, uh, it's much more more, more, yeah. more mediated. In fact, uh, the only people who are basically old fashioned, who do things with hands are artists, right? Uh, mm. Even, right, and of course, if you're doing design, you're using AI over time, right? I mean, you know, every time you use Photoshop, Illustrator, you know, After Effects, I mean, there's always intelligence not only intelligence of a computer, but there are hundreds of people who work on with each of the software, right? Every time mm-hmm. you open Photoshop, you get a box with like yeah, 300 people there. So it's mm-hmm. amazing, it's right? It's like every, it's amazing condensation of human intelligence, right? And years yeah. and years of feedback, right? So it's amazing mm-hmm. that actually, actually Photoshop should be better than it is, right? Because there's so much intelligence that goes into it. In terms of transparency, right? Mm. Um, so I think a few years ago, so a few years ago, the studio networks started to become more and more popular. People mm-hmm. realized that we're creating these black boxes and there was like lots of talk about it in journalism, but also in academia. And lots of people are still obsessed about it, but actually it's becoming less of a problem because computer mm-hmm. scientists are smart and very fast. And once we realized that the system we're creating are being integrated right into medicine, into science, into politics. More and more, we realized that you know the future users want transparency, mm-hmm. right? They want to understand uh, how these networks make decisions. And about three years ago, uh, more right, more and more research centers and conferences started to emerge to try to make this uh, kind of AI, which explains itself. And you know it's a complex issue, but we're making, of course, fast progress because mm-hmm. you know many people are working on it, and um, you know we don't know what will happen in the future. So I can't promise that all systems will be able to mm-hmm. explain themselves. But I think it's quite possible to imagine within a few years, mm-hmm. right? You can actually ask these neural networks, and actually it will tell you, like in English or Italian, how it makes the decisions. Uh, um, if, you know, to some extent, right? Now, mm. in terms of your third part of your question, can we use AI lead to new design disciplines? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question, which we can also talk for days, because what's a design, right? Mm. Uh, if you go to the academy, right, design academy, we teach you, I know, user experience design, interface design, communication design, right? So it's you know, very specific. Uh, design kind of professions and skills. Uh, but then, as you know, uh, in the early 2000s, design as a general paradigm suddenly started to become very popular in business. Suddenly, the companies right, started to, we started to mm-hmm. uh, call designers because we realized designers have some uh, working methods which we don't have, such as rapid prototyping, right? We'll be able to kind of ask users, right, what they want. Uh, to design something with users. Uh, and uh, so I think that maybe in the early 2000s, there was this kind of lots of interest in this. Uh, and people realized that design is not just, design doesn't just mean uh, kind of solving problems or doing something to create interface, a product, a web page, mm-hmm. a photograph, but it's also about some kind of general purpose skills, uh, which are different than science, humanities, art and so on right uh, so mm-hmm. to that extent uh, uh i mean the last thing i want to say is sorry i'm giving you a long answer but it's such a wonderful question so if you think about history of design right mm. uh, so before it was crafts right we had kind of dozens of crafts right metal work and paper right and uh, etc so then uh, in 1920s uh, people like bauhaus and also russian Hutimas, right we established this profession of designer who is kind of separate, right, from a craftsperson uh, and separate from a factory, right? So designer designs something and then the factory should produce it. Uh, so we established with professional identities, graphic designer, uh, 
industrial design and so on. I don't know at which point this idea of communication design emerges, probably later, maybe after a war. And then, you know, so we have the disciplines, right, which have to do with objects, uh, hmm. spaces, in, well, not spaces, in 3 design, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, products, objects, products, furniture, and surfaces, right? And then yeah. in the 1990s, there's a big new development. Uh, so if you look at Wikipedia articles about design, at least in English, we may list about 30 different types of design. Half of them did not exist mm. before 96. Mm. Right, so because the culture becomes interactive, right, and people start communicating through interactive interfaces, this leads to, in a few years, to the development of a bunch of new fields like user experience design, uh, interaction design, uh, human computer interaction, that was a bit earlier, uh, uh, the interior design becomes space design, and so on, right? And uh, with information architecture in relation, right, in relation to web, and that's it, right? So basically, we switch to computers and we switch to interactive communication, right? Leads to this whole new revolution in design in terms of new fields, and that's it. And I don't think anything anything happened after that. So I'm not sure anything newly really happened after '98 or '99, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, so in order for new design fields to emerge, there has mm. to be some kind of shift, right? Big shift in society. Mm. Uh, uh, but you know, for example, today where it feels like environmental, right? You can get degree in environmental design, right? Mm -hmm. I think, right? Or environmental, yeah, I think environmental design, uh, where maybe I'm actually not sure exactly what we study, but mm -hmm. I think maybe we'll have so maybe as the right as the pressure to think about sustainability, climate change, and so on, right? Maybe it becomes more important. Maybe we'll see some future design professions where designers will be. Also have mm. like understanding of science, right? In, you know, more understanding of engineering. Uh, so I think we'll see some shifts, right? And maybe shifts mm. are taking place, but maybe right now we're kind of a bit more, uh, yeah, you know, not as dramatic as what happened in 1920, and not as dramatic as what happened in 1990. And I just want to say one thing. You know how in my work, right? I'm always, I'm always going back to 1920s, right? And you know, I had yeah. this article, right? You know, I had these articles where I compared twenties and nineties, but you can see why it makes sense because both nineteen twenties and nineteen nineties were these periods where lots of cultural change happens, and in fact, the whole new sets of professions come into existence. Right? Yeah, so course. now I'm wondering if we're going to have some future decade, maybe I'm not going to be around when when a similar rapid change will take place, right? So yeah. far, I think what we in this century things are a bit more gradual. Yeah, I was thinking in particular to supercognition AI. So you were yes. saying something about interfaces and the role of interfaces in a better supercognition AI. So I was wondering if in terms of visual communication design, that would be uh, new possibilities for visual communication for that specific supercognition. Uh, AI that needs better interfaces. So maybe the topics of visual communication design and the way to make visible what is invisible uh, and what is so uh, important for our daily life uh, seems to be interesting. Well, you know, just to give you one example, right? So, uh, I mean, you can also, you can think about history of culture in terms of dealing with information density, right? You yeah. Know, like, for example, if you think about the newspapers, right, uh, which begins sometimes, I don't know, something like 17th century. So gradually, if I remember, like, I was a Japanese uh, museum of, like, print of newspapers. So you can see how over, like, 100 years, the print becomes more and more dense, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And the same thing happens with computers, right? So you can say, you know, that uh, part of evolution of culture is dealing with, like, density and trying to kind of Try to figure out right how to use limited limited human memory, limited human like limited human, right? Very limited human processing kind of system, right? And to mm -hmm. have human process more information. But mm -hmm. I think at some point, like in early 2000s, we just have this explosion, right? You know, and suddenly the designers say, Well, we don't know how to do it, right? So how do we make World Wide Web, how do we make 20 billion pages visible in the interface? We just mm -hmm. give up, right? And then yeah. the computer scientists came in and say, okay, guys, you know, you don't have to deal with it. It's too complex. We'll just give you a very simple solution. 
which is with kind of super cognition, but with super cognition, it's also idiotic cognition. We'll say, okay, you want to find something online. Actually, there's mm -hmm. a million pages which are relevant to you, but we'll just show you 10 pages and you're going to click on the first page, which is going to be Wikipedia, if it's good enough, right? Uh, <laughs> so my point is that uh, we can say that for the last 20 years, we designed, we designed the field, you can say more or less, kind of give up, right? Kind of give up on this very difficult task. Uh, but, you know, I can start imagining all kinds of things. Imagine you get search results, but they're animated. You know, yeah. maybe there's like some scrolling, maybe there's some animation, maybe there's some kind of sizing going on, right? And people have been doing this kind of experiments a lot, actually, in the 90s and early 2000s. And we don't think it kind of died. You know why? It died because of this. Because yeah. this object has been the most, has killed creativity in the last, in the last 30 years. Because it has <laughs> such a low resolution, right? And has such an idiotic interface. You operate one hand, but, but everything became big, right? You know, in fact, the resolution, right? The resol the resolution, the resolution of websites became even smaller because everything is now designed for a phone. So mm -hmm. now in a few years, when the phone becomes, I think like, you know, we already have this color, right? uh, kind of foldable phone already. And when the phone surface becomes bigger, when we have a larger surface, which is more high resolution, maybe we'll have mm -hmm. some interesting developments in design. But in the last 13 years, because of, this is such a right poor kind of interface, uh, people didn't think about how to present more information People thought how to present less information, you know. Perhaps. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry uh, for multiple multiple answers here, but a very interesting question. Right? Yeah, it could be. We could continue, so what but about, uh, what about, what, maybe, yeah, what maybe about, we can what, start with a... Yeah, please, oh, sorry, show, show me what you got, yeah, with students. Oh, uh, yeah. So maybe, maybe we can start with questions from public. So if... Uh, public, yes. There are any suggestions, any questions? So please uh, write in chat. Chi volesse fare domande, scrivete magari in chat. Ask me, ask me, right? You can also write parola. in Italian. We can, we can translate, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Sono okay. timidi. Okay, perfect. First talk, first question in chat. Yes. Okay. Uh, someone that want, wanted to ask you, how did you find your way and how you managed all your interests? It's an ex student in ISEA and uh, now it's uh, specializing in digital humanities. So how yes. did you find your sure. way? <laughs> well, I actually, you know, I actually normally I don't talk about my biography. Maybe I should like write a biography, you know, finding my way. <laughs> but uh, I did, uh, yes, but I did, you know, right, I did spend actually about 10 minutes or 15 minutes in the beginning, but I kind of told you more about, about like, right, the, the kind of the stages in my way, but I didn't really tell you, right, the logic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I said, I said a little bit about it, but let me make it more explicit, right? Mm. Um, so I think the challenge of our time is mm. that, People, right? People in this audience, young people, you guys are too smart. Meaning, you understand mm -hmm. limitations of existing structures in society, right? So, mm -hmm. big designer is a kind of limiting because you have to work for clients. Not all clients are amazing. Being artist is kind of limiting because it's kind of idiotic field, right? It's too much hype, and you have to work with curators and collectors who are not most smartest people in the world, right? Being scientist is fantastic, but then you have to publish scientific articles and compete for funding. So you're around really smart people, but it's right. So so the problem is all the fields today, you know, you see the limits, right, very clearly. And uh, I meet so many people who basically said, Lev, I'm a bit of a scientist, I'm a bit of an artist, I'm a bit of a designer, what do I do? My answer is mm -hmm. that I don't know, right? I think our society really has to change fundamentally. <laughs> Uh, maybe we have to recognize, right, with this uh, kind of kind of structures, right, with boxes which we inherited from the past are very limiting. Uh, and I don't know how society, right, uh, will change. But I think for now, you sort of have to you have to have a base, right, in one of these areas, right. And then you can work with people in other fields and do other things. So in my case, right, 
because there are so many people today who say, well, I'm a kind of artist, an influencer, and a model, and journalist. And when you, like, when you say wonder, like, what is you actually, what is your specialty, right? What are you good at, right? So mm -hmm. I think you do have to maybe, I mean, again, I don't know, right? Because things are changing, but I think it's probably a good idea, at least for some people, to select a particular field, which will be very base, but you should select a field as your base field, right? Where you feel comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I basically eventually, right? I didn't become artist because I just find art world to be just too ridiculous, idiotic, you know, pompous, fake. I didn't, be, I didn't select science as my kind of, as my sort of um, home field because the scientists are wonderful, but normally maybe Italy is different, but in America, we don't really care about culture. We don't have mm -hmm. a good taste. So I selected humanities, right? And especially new media is kind of my field because I like people like Valentina, right? We can, can really get along with her and spend lots of time. But with many artists, I'll be very bored and scientists are also bored, right? So, uh, so I think, you know, so I think you kind of have to imagine, right? What were people who will be your colleagues? Who were people you're going mm -hmm. to be mailing with, going to conferences with? And do you like these people? And you, you know, and even though it will be kind of compromised, you have to recognize it. Try to select a field where it becomes your family, dysfunctional family that becomes your family. And maybe you can do other things, you know? So maybe that's like, a, you know, that's kind of um, my answer, but it's also not perfect, right? So <laughs> people still think of Lev, he's like new media, but I hate new media, right? When I see my old digital art friends, I just run away because we don't change. You know, we do the same thing that 20 years ago, I'm bored. Uh, so, you know, you can also change. Anyway, so question about social dilemma, yes. Uh, Yes, so social dilemma. So, you know, I have to say that I haven't actually watched this uh, documentary because I kind of know that I'm probably not going to like it uh, because probably it presents, you know, a very critical view. And um, so my perspective, right, on social media and also algorithms is that, you know, most, right, most important phenomenon in life, they're both good and bad. Right. So the civilization, for example, right, the development of medicine and so on, right? People live longer lives. You know, we we don't worry about being killed tomorrow, like half hundred years ago. But are people more happy? Hard to say, right? Uh, so I think uh, such a very complex and important phenomenon like internet and social media, we also have every possible effect. But in thinking about the effects, you know, I don't think about the West which is a very small number of very privileged people. I think about the rest of the world, right? Eight and a half billion people. I think about China, 1.3 billion people. I think about Russia. I think about, you know, Hong Kong. Right? I think about all these other countries where uh, societies which are less democratic so, or societies which have uh, maybe, you know, more corruption, even maybe more than South of Italy, and how internet really enables people to basically have a business to make a living it enables people in a small city to find friends outside the very small city who are interested in the same things uh, to find groups to organize demonstrations uh, to fall in love and so on uh, and uh, you know 20 years ago when the web just started to emerge everybody was very optimistic about the web Everybody was uh, projecting all kinds of utopian ideas. I didn't do it. I said, that basically, it's a technology which will have both good and bad effects. And today, the same people became very negative, right? About internet and social media. Why? Because we don't really care about technology. We don't really care about what's in the world. We just want to see uh, kind of some kind of utopian, right? Equal society. So first, these people very, you know, supportive of internet. Uh, because we thought it, it will become like a mechanism which will lead to the society. And then we realized, actually, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and so on, their companies and uh, Facebook, right, and, and so on are used for advertising. They can be very critical. But, you know, for me, right, uh, my ideas didn't change. You know, think about millions and millions of freelance people. People teach yoga, I don't know, people sell pizza, you know, people buy something on AliExpress and resell it, right? 
hundreds of millions of people who make me a living from Instagram, Facebook, uh, and so on accounts. Why we have to, why we have to, what? Well, you want to close the internet to them and make these people go poor, right? Uh, you want to, you know, right? In, in a place like China, Facebook would be the most amazing thing, right? Because, you know, it's blocked, right? And uh, people have to go, you know, and uh, use our kind of techniques and you know, VPNs are blocked and so on, right? So when I think about the effect of these technologies globally, uh, I think they're very positive. And here I uh, follow the recent interview I saw with a very with a top Russian uh, female pop singer. She's like a Russian kind of pop star. And when we ask her, like, what do you think is the best thing humanity have invented? She said, internet. And I agree. Okay. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's so wonderful. Obviously, it's used for false information, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I do believe uh, in the intelligence of scientists. You know, around 2000, everybody was worried about 2000 bug, right? How internet is going to be destroyed, but people fixed it. I do think that uh, the scientists will be able to, over time, you know, control uh, a large part or maybe all of fake information. You know, internet is not fixed. Uh, but in the same time, like, what do you, I mean, what do you expect, right? You created this medium, mass medium, and you open it to everybody. So, of course, people are going to put fake information. People are going to sell bad things. I mean, what do you expect, right? Internet will reflect both good things and bad things about the society. Uh, but, you know, as somebody who grew up in a totalitarian, closed society of Soviet Union, somebody who grew up in a communist society, I do believe the internet is the best best thing humanity has ever invented after after Urbino and Padua and Pisa, you know. Okay, uh, what's next? Uh, was Hitler? Wow, you guys have amazing questions. Was Hitler short-sighted when he claimed there is no software? Uh, well, you know, all of us, all of us are limited by a particular time, right? When we grew, when we grow up, uh, I may have no understanding of contemporary media landscape. You guys are listening to me, but maybe you shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> I don't know. So, you know, Hitler, Friedrich Hitler, right, was a you know very influential, I mean, really genius, uh, a German media scholar, maybe most important person after McLuhan, and one of his you know kind of right famous claims. Uh, he had an article called "There Is No Software," and what it is, it's a kind of modernist, it's a kind of modernist critique of software, right? Uh, and this idea was not really unique to him. This idea was kind of common in the 1980s and 90s, right? Because in the 70s, computers were used by you know very few people, and you had to program them, so you were kind of close to the machine. But then, after Macintosh came out, right, it kind of popped, you know, and IBM also released Windows. Millions of people started to use computers. So the computers became right much easier to use. We became more popular, but you're no longer programming like a machine, right? You have these beautiful windows and icons. So you kind of removed, right? Uh, and people, lots of people didn't like it. They said, oh, you know, you're no longer kind of close to a machine. You're no longer programming a machine. You removed, you give the solution. But my argument is that the solution is what enables Billions of people to use computers. The solution is what enables billions of people to use internet, to connect, to fall in love, to sell things, to learn, right? Here we are communicating via Zoom. Imagine if I had to type everything in the assembler or binary code, you know, we, this meeting would never happen. Uh, so I think that Hitler is, you know, was amazing. Uh, but, you know, like even most amazing people don't get everything right. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, this argument is indeed was limiting. Uh, I think. Uh, what else? Uh, in software, new paradigm in media, one which will swallow uh, media forms. Uh, wow, did you guys like, you guys like, is it like every question is amazing? Or how is it possible? It's like a, you know, it's best, best set of questions I got this year, you know? That's amazing. Oh my God, I want to visit. Valentina, I don't hear you. No, microphone, microphone. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I yeah. was saying that 
uh, it's a very wow. interesting question and maybe it was uh, thinking about it was thinking about it your uh, software takes command so mm, yeah, the yeah. very pervasive nature of software in media and so the question was if software could be a new yeah. paradigm in the current sense of the term uh, the paradigm for uh, for media yes 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 well you know um I kind of don't want to, I mean, I'm, I don't want to give you like a very quick answer because all these questions are very deep, right? And require like days of discussion. Yes. Uh, but let me say something, right? So if, so Thomas Kuhn, right, was uh, this very, uh, right? He suggested very, he, okay, one of the first historians of science. Uh, and then uh, he, I think it was around 1960, right? Early 60s, I don't remember exactly. Mm. He proposed this idea of paradigm. But you know, his idea of paradigm was is that uh, there's a particular kind of set of ideas, right? What scientists study in a particular time. So mm. it defines kind of what you study, what you look at, and how and what questions you ask. And then at some point, right, there is a paradigm change, and now people start looking at different objects and kind of start, mm. right, start asking different questions. So the idea, right, is that there is not some kind of like abstract nature out there, and we just go deeper and deeper and deeper. But mm -hmm. the idea is that the scientific paradigms change, like where we look at and how we look actually changes. Now, this was like uh, 60 years ago, right? Uh, so I think later people have also you know, said, yeah, it's a very good idea, but it's also only partially true, right? So people have also showed that there is more continuity in science. Uh, so sometimes when somebody proposes new idea which is very different everybody likes it because it also opens up right our perspective onto uh, new questions but let us say maybe things are not so right so mm -hmm. different as as you suggest uh well for me software right uh, which i started to, i actually first mentioned software already in 99 in mm -hmm. the manuscript of my book language on media for me at that point there was a new paradigm mm -hmm. uh, because I said, you know, it's basically a new actor, right? It's a new game in town. And if we had to understand uh, how contemporary society kind of works, but also how media works, we have to pay attention, right? And then I developed this idea in my book, Software Case Command, uh, which was written in, 19, in uh, actually 2007. And when I put like a, make like an open source edition, but nobody reviewed it. So when I kind of made, like I revised it, I made like print edition. So I got some reviews in 2013. Uh, and, um, but people also proposed other terms, right? So now we have uh, fields like a game, like we have a critical code studies that people focus on code or algorithm studies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for me, software, like I think it was a most better choice because it kind of includes, right, interface and uh, algorithm and code, right? And uh, interface. Uh, and again, I'm thinking about Zoom, right? So Zoom has become our interface to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it became a verb to Zoom. In the night to night is Photoshop, right, has also become a verb. And uh, in my book, right, I try to talk about how we switch to uh, these interfaces has also had effect on the aesthetics, right, the visual culture, the aesthetics of media. I have a 70 pages analyzing After Effects. Um, so I think, right, I think it is, uh, I think it is, uh, was a good idea, but in my new book, right, my new book, which is published today, right, uh, after, <laughs> after finish, I will go and probably have like some drinks, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but not a lot. Uh, I think I'm actually, I'm actually looking at something else, right? Because what happens again between like, say, 2007, 2008 and 2015, is with the uh, machine learning, right, and big data have also become very important, right? Uh, and they also start influencing uh, decision making, representation, interaction with information, and so on, right? Sometimes in a very invisible way, sometimes, mm -hmm. right, in a very in a very visible way. Like mm -hmm. uh, like ten years ago, automatic translation didn't really work at all. Now it works very well. Mm -hmm. So potentially, I can read books in other languages. Mm -hmm. um, so, it is, so my book, right, the cultural analytics, on the surface, it's about how we can use uh, these kind of big data methods to study culture. But at the same time, it's a kind of theoretical analysis 
of a new stage of culture, right? The new stage of culture, the culture in the age of uh, artificial intelligence and big data, right? The fact that all the, everything we create and put online is being processed by algorithms, and we have recommendation systems and neural networks and uh, decision making, right? And search engines and so on. So in fact, it's kind of about software culture in this new era, uh, where you uh, understand something. Uh, where to understand something, right? You kind of compare it to millions and billions of other other objects, right? So we can also maybe think about it a bit semiotically, right? Uh, so <laughs> you know, when I was twenty or twenty-five, I said, okay, here's the image, here's a painting. So what does this painting mean, right? Maybe I have to describe all the brush strokes, all the color patches. But today, you can say, right, in order for a computer to understand this painting, it learns mm -hmm. about millions of paintings, right? Uh, so, uh, so the object, the, right, the kind of meaning, the structure, the understanding, the cognition of the object is very much about not just what's inside it, but what's inside billions of other similar objects, right? And mm -hmm. maybe this relation, or maybe this relational paradigm was always part of you know, semiotics or whatever. But I think now it became came, came to the surface, right? Mm -hmm. That you know, there is a, right, there is the latest uh, latest uh, model in uh, uh, kind of language understanding and language generation. Uh, and the way this, this model was trained, we used like something like ten million dollars to train it. it. Was trained by a company called OpenAI, and basically we just fed it. Pretty much all over the web. So cover it all over the web, and that's how I learned you know, to write, right? So maybe it oh, is yeah. a bit similar. Well, maybe it is a bit similar to how humans learn, right? You also process mm -hmm. so much information. Um, but um, right. Anyway, so okay. So what was the next one? Uh, so, stru wait. Structural persistent. Oh, sorry. So yeah. yeah, we have a a question uh, from a colleague of mine it's a semiotician it's federico montanari federico se vuoi far la domanda tu ovviamente poi nel frattempo la leggo uh, so it's of course very interested in your topics and in your uh, talk of today and um, he was talking about your concept of structural persistence uh, in terms of structural persistence under the collection of millions of images. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's asking if uh, there is a sort of stereotypical pressure provided by Instagram interface. So if, if, if it's possible or not, and how we can discriminate effective new social creation in the um, structure uh, of uh, stereotypical pressure of Instagram, in some way. Well, first of all, Frederica, Bajorna, very nice to meet you. And I <laughs> hope one day, one day to meet you like in the kind of non-Zoom reality. Yeah. Uh, so it's okay. But um, I want to make sure that I understand, right, more precisely your question. And sorry that we have to speak in this very kind of uh, language of accountants, which is English, mm -hmm. as opposed to Italian and or Russian, which are languages for cultural theory. <laughs> poetry <laughs> anyway but what is it what is exactly what do you mean exactly by stereotypical pressure because you know i can have some idea what you mean but it can actually mean a few different things so maybe you can mm -hmm. give me some example of what it is or maybe valentina if you understand you can explain uh i don't know if federico is uh online federico can you can you hear us hi oh hi hi hi, hi. hi. how are you thank you for your uh, talk uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Now I was uh, thinking about uh, your work uh, about uh, Instagram and uh, um, uh, and so on. Uh, I was thinking that from one side, okay, um, there is um, the possibility of understanding what is uh, happening under a collection of millions of images, no, mm -hmm. in terms of shapes of. Uh, colors, uh, and so on. But uh, I was uh, wondering, uh, also reading uh, another um, paper made by our colleague, uh, semiotician, and uh, um, uh, we were asking if uh, there is uh, um, 
uh, in, for instance, in using uh, uh, Instagram filters, uh, hmm? yeah, uh, a, a lot of uh, okay, automatic uh, work made by uh, software, made by machine, made by uh, the interface, mm -hmm. and uh, what happens uh, in a relationship between this automatic work provided by uh, Instagram uh, app and uh, yeah. what is uh, going on in the social. Uh, uh, production, creative uh, production of images. I mean, I, I don't want to be romantic, uh, uh, mm -hmm. an opposing machine and uh, human and uh, no, uh, all mm -hmm. creativity. But uh, sure. I was uh, wondering if, uh, um, for instance, the use of filters is not a sort of a, a generalized stereotypical, uh, um, I mean, um, yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. You understand? Yeah. Okay. I understand. So yeah. Was, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Just well, for well, well to, okay. Yeah. So, Thank Valentina, you. actually, before I answer, Valentina, is it possible for you to say the chat? Because I would like to have a record of his questions and mm. put it on the wall because it's one, some, mm. one of the best sets of questions I've gotten. Can you, is it part, because in, in Zoom, you can, I can just like save it, but. Okay, maybe um, I'm just are, okay. I would, I would, I would just, I would just save it. I would just save it yeah, to yeah. my, uh, to me because it's just so nice to have. Maybe I can think more about them, and maybe I can write something, mm -hmm. you know, about about this uh, about these topics. Um, so um, yeah, so well, so if we think about right, we think about this right. So um, uh, you know, I'm just trying to lots. I can say lots of things, but I'm trying to approach. Think about how to approach it in some kind of a, you know, so it wouldn't take forever. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, okay. So let me maybe say one thing, right? So, uh, so in my book, in my book, which was kind of right, basically written around 2000, early 2016, about Instagram, right? Um, yeah. So it's kind of talks about Instagram, right? 2012, 2016. So it was already a while ago, uh, and people were still using filters, but already at the time, people started to use, right, our software and other apps. And how do we know about it? So there are millions of videos, right, on YouTube, where young young people, right, typically some, right, show you how they edit their, their photos. And for the first time in the kind of history, right, of modern culture, you get insight, right, into how people kind of, create culture. Uh, I mean, of course, there are also millions of tutorials by professional photographers, which I also watch, uh, Lightroom, but I love watching these tutorials. You know, and you can see people who never went to art school, design school, you know, maybe using three, four different apps and they're taking their photo from here to here. And the degree of sophistication is amazing. Uh, so it kind of moved on beyond simply using a filter, right? Uh, filters, with filter in this Instagram is introduced filters in 2010, because at that point, the, the quality of uh, mobile images was very was very poor, right? You know, the, the camera the resolution was very poor, and it was basically a way to kind of mask this bad quality and to make images aesthetic. In fact, this was what created, creators of Instagram have said. But since then, it became more sophisticated, and uh, I actually like using, so my, for my own photos, I don't use anything. I only use Instagram controls because for me, it's almost like it's almost like avant-garde, right? I like the constraints. I like only using controls, you know, in Instagram app, you know, but they're quite good controls like brightness, you know, contrast, right, uh, color, but people use, you know, Photoshop, Lightroom, etc. cetera. Um, so one thing is, right, by watching these videos, you can actually get ideas, right, of how people edit their photographs. Uh, and then uh, what I basically wanted, this was just introduction, but what I really wanted to talk about is something else, right? So in my book, I kind of make this very, you know, kind of black and white distinction, right? I said, okay, there are normal people who just kind of photograph things which are important to them, like a family members, okay, a family, okay, birthday, or maybe we went together to have some meals, so we photograph their food. And uh, I kind of implied with people, don't take care about composition, aesthetics, and so on. And when I talked about kind of professional photographers who bring professional kind of photographic aesthetics, and when I talk about this Instagrammers, right, uh, kind of Instagramism, uh, this kind of younger generation, right, of people who are also maybe dress better, right, uh, 
people who love cafes and love red cappuccinos and love minimalism and uh, you know people for whom uh, creation of aesthetic experience it's a kind of very identity which is a very asian thing right because what i learned recently uh, in in philosophical aesthetics there has been a uh, whole debates about uh, aesthetics in everyday life and what people are saying uh, is that in the west with everyday life and there is art and art is something which is like you go to a museum to see art or you go to a rich person palace to see art whereas supposedly in asian tradition i don't know what's true or not right everything is aestheticized uh, because your whole everyday life has to be aesthetic right and i don't know what's true but definitely it's what i'll see in korea right uh, in fact the worst things in korea i see when i go to art gallery right it's just terrible but everything else is fantastic right just to walk on the street anyway but what I want to say is that I think I maybe oversimplified things. So when I watch, right, how people people like take photographs, like I go to cafe, right? I like to watch people take photographs and take selfies. I don't know if there are many people who, when we take photographs, don't think at all about any aesthetic parameters. Yeah? I think people still, like people may have some idea implicit in their head but there is a good good photographs and bad photographs, right? So maybe people learn that the subject has to be in the center and the horizon line has to be horizontal. And uh, maybe people think about how busy background is and blur. And I would love, right? I would love to know what, uh, you know, what is the distribution, right? What's the distribution of this kind of, uh, how do you say, aesthetic attitude, right? So are there actually people who just almost like robots just take photographs over over pizza and don't think about anything and then there are people on the other hand who are like very very sophisticated right and how many people are in between like i would love to know that and you know if possible you can study it empirically but i really have no idea um and also what i'd like to know is that uh the you know the, the social phenomena such as instagram right you know, do we make society more aesthetically sophisticated, right? Are there more people today than five years ago, 10 years ago, who think about these things? Uh, and I think that if we to talk about these questions, we have also to ask about what happens in other areas of culture, right? Like, uh, so I'm basically developing a book slowly, which I call Aesthetic Society, uh, because it turns out that in English, in this term, uh, actually, I haven't seen people use this term, which is surprising. And I'm talking about the design revolution, right? We design hotels and so on, which starts in mid nineties. Uh, but you know, right? But you know what I mean, right? So the idea is that the industrial society, right? Created the separation between industrial products, which mostly were not very beautiful, not very aesthetic, maybe except maybe Italy in the sixties, I don't know, right? Uh, and then, you know, the rich products, you know, the, the couture. And then in the nineties, right, it starts changing. So at some point, right, all the hotels look the same, like these kind of modern Hilton hotels. At some point, Fab Stark starts building design hotels. And today, all the new hotels are design hotels. If you go to Thailand for $10, you go and stay in the, in the hostel, which is better than $500 hotel in New York. Right, so the idea is that this aesthetic sophistication, uh, detailization, perfection, and aesthetization uh, have become aspects of kind of mass culture, right? Mass industry. And uh, Zara, right, of course, or uh, HM are good examples, right? I can go to Zara and anything I buy looks good. And I can just put items together and I basically go outside and I look as good or better when if I go and, and spend millions of dollars on Prada, you know, uh, you, you know Gucci and so on, right? Uh, in fact, you know, when you go to some mall in uh, Jap you know, in Korea or China, the most boring thing I would have a clothes from is higher kind of designers, uh, and, right? So, so I think something happens. And again, maybe in Italy, this is less of a change because maybe in Italy things were different, I don't know. But at least in the America and other countries, there's a big change between mid nineties and today. And, uh, you know, it's very simple to see. Like, for example, New York Times, we have a complete archive of all New York Times. So if you go to New York, if you subscribe to New York Times, you go to New York Times, we have, it's called New York Times machine, archive machine. And you see, how did New York Times look in 1990? 
it's ugly, but it's no design. It's just some ugly fonts, right? And now, of course, it's this amazing, amazing object. So I think, uh, so my question is, is this aesthetization, which is taking place in consumer society in general over the last 20 years, does it mean that more and more people uh, become aesthetically more sophisticated and Instagram is just a reflection of it? Uh, or do these filters and these tools almost automatically kind of make people take good photographs just as I think if you go to Zara, you actually have to, if you go to Zara and you spend a bit of money, you have to work hard to go outside looking ugly. You automatically are going to look good because all objects are well designed, more or less, all objects coordinate. Uh, so that's a very interesting question. So I don't have an answer, uh, but this is simply, I think, to imply that I think Instagram and images, I think what's happening, it's like a part of this larger processes. And I know that Italy is maybe the only country where people think about design aesthetics very seriously. Uh, and uh, I'm waiting for answers from 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 you guys. You know, so can I just can I just intervene? Thank you, thank you very please, much. Please, thank you. please, please, yes. Sorry, so, just more questions, but you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a short remark on this this topic, which we discussed now. Hi, Federico, Valentina, and of course, uh, hi, Lev. Always <laughs> a question. Yeah, ju just a short um, oh, yeah. address of uh, Federico's question. Yeah, this this. This kind of a... I'm going to take my hat because it's getting warm here. I have to. I'm getting. I'm getting warm because you guys are so. Like my brain works. My brain works so hard. I'm. I'm going to overheat. I'm going to. I have to open. I'm going to overheat. It's just, I have to open the window. It's just, you're like really making. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Okay. Actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. This yeah. issue of stereotypical question uh, pressure basically amounts to, let's call it kind of a conformism conformist tendency which is not necessarily generated by new technologies or whatever it's just a tendency a psychological tendency usually uh, uh, well, yeah, I, think, I, I think it's not only humans but also animals right oh, you know, right. Like, i mean right you know like uh, you know we're, we're like you know there's some small animals we fall right we follow others we follow mother it's basically right it's uh, it's also what uh, what uh, just a second sorry i'm interrupting it's also what Tardy said, right? Like Latour explained, it's about imitation, and you know, it's it's. I think I think that people, like, the, the, the industry today, so much promotes creativity, but actually, in, imitation is kind of how human culture works, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, <laughs> nothing wrong. I think yeah. the problem today we have so much bullshit stuff is that everybody's trying to be creative, and it's a problem. With it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, go, like, go on. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so I I mean we all uh, some of us who are more how should I say, close to the idea of creativeness, we are interested in this, we always presume that there is a large amount of creativeness behind every person. We, we kind of start from there and say, yeah, right, right. it's somewhere where also Federico starts. He says, can we see what's behind? Can we see what is behind these choices? We always presume there is large uh, amount of creativity behind, but it's not necessarily so. Actually, you started your lecture by saying, look at the history of art or whatever, sculpture, painting, design. I mean, you will see a couple of guys uh, changing things. We will see yeah, yeah, yeah. guys, not millions of guys, just just some guys changing things. Guys, and, and, but but now, now there's a change now, but a couple of guys and also a couple of girls, right? So that's a big yeah, change yeah, yeah. In, in, uh, after okay. 1970s. So, so maybe we have like not two people, but we have four people. So, exactly. so, so when I think about feminism, we can actually, we can actually now find out there's actually been not two people, but four people, but still four, not, not, not four million, right? Mm -hmm. So thanks to feminism, we, we can remember more people. Anyway, yeah. So, you know, basically yeah. what I mean, we always come down to some, some individuals, let's call them individuals, being female or, or male, doesn't, anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It's not relevant anymore in, in that way. Uh, so, so what we do actually is we always kind of condense things somewhere, and in a way, you are a good example of this. What you are doing, what you did first of all with the language of new media, you were able to condense certain uh, volumes, big volumes of knowledge, into one volume, which really makes a fantastic, fantastic impact. So we have we have an insight into a huge number of things happening around us, but condensed, even I would say in a sense of uh, uh, 
uh, how should we put it, co computer science way. You were able to, to, to uh, take it down to a code. You found the code which is underlying a huge number of things happening behind. So now you're doing the same with the, with the cultural analytics. I will, I will stop here. I don't, I don't want to waste too much of your time. We will have a opportunity. Oh, no. Go on, no, please, go on. I mean, I like it. <laughs> no, but, but what's your question? No, first what of all, thank you so much. And, yeah. you know, um, you know, when you tell me how language and media was good, you, only, you can give me stress because, you know, uh, what happens, what I realize many people, including me, you know, mm -hmm. many people, we, we make their best work. We make this one book when we're like 39 or 42. <laughs> I know. Just, so I finished my book, I was 39, and then after that, you can write 100 books, but somehow you never can make the same breakthrough. Uh, partly because I think the field was not so big in the 90s. Yeah. And after that, you know, I can see why I can see now why people write about history, cultural history, because it's like it's set, right? Uh, I mean, every moment I finish a book, there's like millions of more research, but anyway, I'm hoping that. I was able to condense some things in a new book, but but anyway, but you want to ask a question also? Which is yeah, you did actually a great yeah, yeah. With the new book, but with the new book. cultural analytics is actually probably most of us know this this whole story from Frankfurt School. This this cultural industry issue was like an like a bad word, like a really ugly word for Adorno, Hort, Horkheimer. Yeah, yeah. So this was an F word of the time, yeah, of, of philosophy of their time. But now, what you did with cultural analytics, you actually made, in a way, a successful marriage of the two, of the mass production and the possibilities of analytics of this mass production. The problem which Adorno had probably, uh, let's put it this way, uh, was that he couldn't tap into this huge mass production. He just couldn't. This was not possible at the time. You couldn't analyze it, no matter how hard you tried. What you did now, and you don't really need to worry about making a new breakthrough because you're making it now. Uh, actually, you said, actually, you found a way to tap into this huge production, be it industrial or, or whatever, even creative in the sense of one person or, or many one persons. You found a way to tap into it analytically. To able to talk about it in a relevant way. Up until now, it was impossible. How can you talk relevantly about hundred zillion uh, items which you cannot even analyze? You cannot. But, but, not, but, yeah. but, but, you know, but I want to say something. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we'll see how people like it or not. But I want to uh, maybe just say a few words about what I said at the end. I was a bit speeding up, like I always do, when I showed these Instagram images. So this is what I realized in the last few years, right? Um, uh, so the modern, the modern period, right, in human thought, it's a period of reduction, mm -hmm. where in fact, in science, in humanities, in art, people figure out ways to reduce multitude of experience, right, to a small number of structures, but not in a very dogmatic way, right? Like, I think if you look at the like, ancient thought or maybe medieval thought, sometimes it was too reductive, you know? Like, mm. you know, or even, even like maybe ancient thinking, right? You know, God and human, you know, black and white, young ink, right? Everything becomes binary. So that was too much. You know, but when um, in the 19th century, you know, the science says, okay, we can reduce reality to molecules and atoms and the rules of interaction between atoms, so it's a kind of reduction, but it's not so dogmatic, right? It allows you to describe different mm -hmm. objects, etc. And then Saussure says, okay, we can language, we can talk about uh, signifiers and signifiers, right? And Freud talks about, you know, conscious, unconscious, right, etc. Eat. Uh, Marx talks about, you know, mode of productions. So some of these reductions are very, maybe going too far. Some of these reductions I still, you know, very nuanced, but it's a reduction. So it doesn't matter if you look at science or social thinking or humanities and the structuralism, right, is another example of this reduction. Probe reduces, right, functions and folktales to like 28. Even eventually, Saussure says it's binary oppositions. Even Grema says it's a semiotic square, right? Which I think even mm -hmm. this point becomes too much, right? Because you no longer see the differences. Oh. Well, so, you know, when I, when I got very excited about this idea of cultural analytics, and of course, other people, not only me, 10, 15 years ago, 
I thought, okay, if we have enough computers, right, enough graduate students, uh, we can basically download, you know, every website from every museum, every design school, every designer, uh, every portfolio from Behance, right, every Instagram image, and apply AI techniques. I was really thinking of it, and we can have this dynamic uh, kind of observatory of culture where we can reduce culture to maybe a few thousand, I don't know, or maybe 5,000, maybe 500, kind of like structures, right? A particular composition, a particular image, a particular meaning, and we can mm -hmm. see how these elements uh, just change, right? When do these elements emerge? So here's somebody in Urbino in design school in 2006, invents a new element, and maybe this element spreads out, or here is Zaha Hadid, invents a new shape, and then Two weeks later, everybody copies the shape in architecture schools, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, you can say it was a bit of a structuralist idea, but because I thought now we have computers, we don't have to reduce it to binary positions. We can actually have like, you know, 5,000 elements, five, you know, even 5 million elements. But now I think this is still is a bit too simplistic. And that's what I was trying to say. I think mm -hmm. there are many forms of culture where this reduction would be enough. You know, I think, I think even about some kind of minimalist, minimalist art from the 60s, right? Mm. I know, solely wheat, solely right? Or Italian minimalism. Maybe you have a square, and then the square just becomes like, he just varies one parameter, so the square becomes rectangle. But you can actually describe it using a simple formula, you're done. Mm. But now think about these Instagram photos, right? They're not, which I showed, they're not amazing. They're not, you know, it's not geniuses, but they're good very nuanced, very sophisticated. And what I'm now thinking is that I can throw the most sophisticated AI system, which can analyze, you know, colors, textures, content, eye, eye positions. So I can extract maybe 95% of content from these images. But maybe even 99%, but maybe it's going to be 1%, which I can't describe, and that's actually what matters. Uh, and I think it's this 1%, which maybe separates the amazing design and the amazing artwork from just good enough. Uh, maybe it's 1%, maybe it's half percent, maybe it's 5%. And because we ourselves don't know what this 1% is, maybe we don't even know how to measure. Or maybe if we use, you know, uh, more advanced forms of AI and more advanced forms of neural networks, uh, because now there are more and more types, maybe we can figure it out. But I became like a bit more, how do you say, a bit more skeptical. Uh, or I'd say I became more aware about the limits with so-called cultural analytics, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, because what I realized is that uh, I think there are forms of culture today in the past, which in fact, you can really kind of describe them quite comprehensively using neural network, or using algorithms, or using simply like manually using rules. But there are other forms of culture where some tiny nuances is make all the difference. You know, there's a particular shape which speaks to me. Uh, and my example is, let's say you are editor of a fashion magazine, right? Or editor of a, some, you know, it's a magazine, and you send a photographer to photograph Valentina, because Valentina is famous uh, for the issue of Vogue, maybe, you know, want to feature beautiful dress I don't know. <laughs> okay, and the photographer takes 700 photographs of Valentina. Mm. Give it to a computer, and the computer say we're exactly all the same. We're all equally good. Oh, yeah? But maybe uh, maybe the editor is going to look at this and spend like three hours and say, no, this photograph is better. Oh, right? okay. I don't, so I kind of don't know, mm -hmm. right? I still mm -hmm. do experiments mm. with computers and editors. I don't know if it's true or not, but I kind of wonder that uh, eventually this project of cultural analytics at a certain point runs against the same difficulty as a general project of artificial intelligence because the computer can describe information in the image, but it doesn't really understand, doesn't have eyes, doesn't have bodies, etc. Mm -hmm. right? I don't know, I don't know if it's true, and it may not be true always, but I think there are situations where this is going to be true, where this purely kind of statistical, mathematical description will be limiting, mm -hmm. Uh, because you know the reason kind of music, films, architecture, people faces, right? The reason we react to them is to mm -hmm. our whole experience, our bodies, and not simply not simply like the pixels in some on somebody's face, right? So <laughs> this, this is not to deny the project, but this is simply I think to acknowledge 
limitations and maybe think more about this limitation and do some experiments is ultimately at the end, right? I don't really care, right? If I learn, if cultural analytics works, what's important is I'm going to maybe learn a bit more about how mm -hmm. art works, how design works, you know, yeah. and it's a general humanistic project, right? So big data and AI is just the tools for me, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so just a, just a footnote, just a bit of self-criticism as, as we used to see in China, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but any Thank tool, you. any tool which enables us even, as I said, to tap into this, we, we had no tool until now. We didn't even know how to grasp with these huge volumes of, you can call them data, but you can also call them artwork or, or art producers. At least we, we, have, we have a tool. You actually presented us with new ways to use existing technical tools, and we can see what comes out. We don't know the results. Interpretation is always yours. It's always a human being in the end interpreting something. But at least we can tap into huge volumes of data and have something back. Otherwise, we cannot. We simply cannot. Well, you know, I, I think I don't, right? I can't do it for myself. And, you know, when I think about the project we have done in the lab, we've done so little, but it was really more like to show people what can be done. I basically said, yeah, we're having tools, we're using the industry, but we can also use them. But I think the tools, I mean, with, I wish I had like a second life, right? And I can just spend two years actually learning about neural networks because I think potential is very interesting. Like, hmm. for example, if you think about the famous article of Roland Bard from the early 60s. She tries to analyze advertising images. Yeah. He, says, okay. he said, where do, where do you have sign in this advertising for, for pasta, right? For, uh, it, 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 I think he called it, 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 it Italianicity, right? For Italy. He said, it's kind of spread out. But you know, today, mm -hmm. neural networks can tell you, right? Because when you train neural networks, when neural networks, you can train it to recognize the concept of like Italian. And then you can see how it does it. And you can have this image um, where it will highlight parts of the image, which somehow activate the network to produce this meaning of Italian. So, hmm. you know, perhaps, so I think, I think my feeling is like, I'm not an expert, unfortunately, but I think actually there is definitely some progress. There's definitely some progress, you know, here. And um, yeah. I think we just, I just wish we could all be, go to school, right? And be trained in design, semiotics, oh. you know, and neural networks, uh, because until you, know, you become professional, all I'm doing is answering people's emails, right? And, you know, uh, uh, 10 years ago, I was able to somehow take a break and uh, I actually didn't open any any mail. I didn't open any email. I didn't do my taxes for two years. I just learned that. <laughs> so if you see me disappearing completely from Horizon for two years, it means I'm, I'm sitting like learning, you know, networks. Uh, but, um, but, you know, what I want to say is what I think, I don't think it should be dismissed. I think there's something very serious where, and uh, I think what's interesting about these networks hmm. is that, uh, uh, so there's one example which I didn't show, uh, but you know, there's like research paper. So basically example like this, you train the network, you show it photographs, and hmm. you, you, close, you close bottom part. And then, and then the network can synthesize potential lower part of photograph. Hmm. Right? So, for example, like where's a, where's a kind of right? Where's a, you, you give a photograph of a glass sitting at the table, you close the bottom part, and then it gives you gives you new image, full glass on the table with a shadow. Right? Hmm. So I think with networks, I can, in a way, we're acting as genius humanities people. We're kind of learning, in fact, about right as you said, which is love, right? We're learning about patterns of culture, and this semiotic or art historical, what you want to call it, knowledge is embedded inside these networks. But uh, the only people who maybe understand them are computer scientists. So we just need, right, some humanities people who would actually get trained in computer science to extract this knowledge. So maybe these networks already understand the cultural world in a very sophisticated way, at least the mainstream, the popular cultural world, right? Yeah. Uh, right? Uh, exactly. But of course, mm -hmm. of course the perfect know, right? intersection yeah. between to make something visual communication design. Something and original, right? Yeah, so, so, so I think the way with networks are trained, both by artists and can be said, they're trained in particular ways, but I think there are other ways in which you can train them to maybe get something, to maybe get something else. And actually to train them, not as to make, oh my God, it's so amazing, but to train them as a way to kind of show us some knowledge about culture, which, which we can learn, right? Because what we're doing is, right? right? It's like in a way, we're doing what human beings are doing, right? You, you're a genius, a or art historian or whatever. You look at millions of things, 
And when you create a summary, that's what we kind of do it, right? But we have to figure out how to extract how to extract this knowledge. And we also have to put your mind to look at particular areas of culture. And then maybe we can have amazing uh, human machine symbiosis, symbiosis, which will finally lead to victory of semiotics. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. It's uh, very interesting. And I, I, I agree with you. Uh, we would need uh, uh, a sort of intersection between uh, cultural analytics, that is the description as synoptic as possible of what we see, of the totality of what we see, and the uh, cultural approach such as semiotics or uh, visual art or theory of images in order to connect better and to understand better uh, why we see what we see in some way. So um, it would be uh, a very huge topic. So I don't want to, I don't want to add any other, any other points. Uh, but just uh, saying if uh, mm, there are any other questions of suge or suggestions for Lev Manovic. Ci sono altre domande per Lev Manovic uh, a proposito dell'intervento di oggi? Yeah. You know, also, you know, I'm looking, for know? I'm, lo I'm looking for suggestions because, you know, I have a set of, yeah. like, in my mind, I have a list of like six papers and maybe books I'm not sure I want to write. But I'm also happy to take like, uh, you know, my customers, right? Uh, needs right my user needs so if people say left we, we know you can write interesting things about this please do it you can also tell me what i should do no, i will consider it you know like a software company yeah. right? you tell me what features oh, to yes, have you know because maybe mm -hmm. what i'm interested what, what i think is obvious to me is not obvious to you and what i think is interesting to me is not interesting so i'm kind of happy to you know to actually get suggestions uh, yeah. about you know, uh, you can kind of you can collectively direct me like a, like a, like a million net. You know? you yeah, we we we'll be happy to do that. So, uh, dunque, se non ci sono altre domande, forse salutiamo Lev Manovic che è stato così gentile, così disponibile con noi. Uh, Lev, thank you so much for uh, uh, coming and for being here with us uh, and discussing with us about uh, graphic design, visual communication and cultural analytics. Uh, we will we will read your book, I think, and maybe we will uh, uh, re-talk again later in this year well, in, uh, in the next uh, uh, new edition, more analogic, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, want to, I want to say what I will add. I will say goodbye in a second, but only on some conditions. Yeah. First of all, thank you. Uh, this was the best gift mm -hmm. on this day where I'm a bit stressed. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm so amazed at the uh, wonderful questions. Mm -hmm. Really, one of the best experiences I had ever. The second thing is, uh, uh, you know, last year I was a special year. I uh, was uh, doing kind of cultural analytics physically. I spent, I traveled for 340 days. And I spent time in, uh, 18, in uh, 27 cities in 18 countries. But <laughs> unfortunately, I, I missed I missed the most important things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like Urbino. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you know, I, right, people want me to come back to Italy, but I don't know. I was I think I was in this kind of like a, a bit of obsession to like say, okay, I've been to so many places. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I think I think when it becomes possible to travel, I don't know. Hopefully next year, uh, I will definitely. Uh, Italy will be one of my like main. I will only go to a few countries from now on. Italy mm -hmm. probably will be number one because I feel there are so many uh, kindred kind of minds, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, maybe it's this traditional, I know, Italian focus on aesthetics, culture, nuances, which also led people to be interested in these things. Uh, it seems to me that in some culture, in some countries today, people just want to simplify things and. As we discussed yesterday, sometimes only focus on the social and political aspects, mm -hmm. which are very important. Uh, but, you know, uh, as I mentioned yesterday to you, we humans mm -hmm. have culture and images and art even before we had language, right? So now we date images in caves to maybe over 100,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know why, but the creation of analog forms, shapes, sounds, and so on has always been part of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to understand why and we have to teach students about this history and we have to make sure our students make good ones, at least as good as uh, cave paintings 100,000 years ago, which is also was quite a skill. So I will say goodbye only on the condition that 
when it becomes possible to travel, mm -hmm. I will walk to Urbino or, you know, Perfect. and uh, you know, we'll, we'll meet again. Uh, <laughs> and, um, um, and I will, as I said, I will, uh, uh, you know, if you have interesting articles, text in Italian, which you want me to read, I can promise to learn Italian immediately. But thanks to Advanced mm -hmm. AI, if it's in digital form, at least I can put it yeah. in Google Translate and actually get pretty good idea. And, uh, you know, I'm working on a new book with actually somebody from Italy. He teaches in Venice, but lives in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So somehow I feel that the future, my future, part, my future is not about cultural analytics, but my future is also somehow becoming a bit more connected to Italian intellectual seen and uh, and this was just another proof uh you are amazing and mm -hmm. i just want to you know if you want i want to use kind of my connections and my knowledge and my followers to mm -hmm. let you know, other people know right uh, about this amazing discourse and conversations happening in italy so please send me information about your new projects your know, books uh, articles and so on so i can also help it promote mm -hmm. on my on my channels uh, mm -hmm. So think of me as a bit of a PR agent for uh, Italian cultural discourse. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll do, I'll do, Thank I'll do you whatever. so much. I'll we, we will do. We will. Uh, we all do so for you. So let's keep in contact. You did enough for me already. You did enough for me. I want to do for you now, right? <laughs> I, want to, I want to do for you, okay? So, mm -hmm. so thank you so much. I don't know. I don't know. I actually don't know where's the end button, right? So should I say goodbye? Yeah. Okay. Here's the live call. <laughs> so, uh, grazie. And, grazie uh, Alev Manovic di essere stato qui. Um, grazie. Thank you so much. E grazie anche a chi è intervenuto, yeah. che ha fatto be strong, be strong. Uh, yeah. Love, love, love. You know, have relationship, drink, but wear masks sometimes. Uh, wear masks somehow. Stay safe. Because you know we need to survive this, and uh, yeah. I actually, I learned that already two American companies they actually already started making vaccines. We don't know if they're safe, so I think I think the end of the tunnel is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in our six months, maybe more, but it's coming. So, uh, and let's use this time to reflect and maybe make ourselves a bit smarter. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a special moment, special opportunity given to us, a bit less travel, you know, and to be able to have this conversation for many hours. I don't think it was possible before pandemic. So this is also, I think, example yeah. how this uh, mm -hmm. this dark times can also have some beautiful effects, like yeah. Renaissance. Like right? people were dying all the time, like plague, right? Yeah. But it's a moment to Renaissance, so maybe it's okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, I agree with you. We we need to use all that, and so bye bye. <laughs> grazie a tutti, dunque, grazie a chi è intervenuto, e speriamo ci siano altre occasioni di replicare con queste lecture. Grazie a tutti e arrivederci. Buona grazie, giornata. Grazie Valentina. Grazie, <ride> grazie Federico, grazie, grazie Vizoslav. Buona ciao. giornata a tutti, grazie. Ciao. E agli studenti che sono intervenuti. Ciao. Ciao. Grazie ciao. a voi. Grazie ragazzi.